On the night of December 7, 2012, the gaming community was taken by surprise when the sequel to Dark Souls was unveiled during the Spike Video Game Awards. It had only been a few weeks since the expansion Artorias of the Abyss became available, and just a little over a year had passed since the release of Dark Souls itself, making this trailer truly unexpected. Alongside the premiere of the Dark Souls 2 trailer, Bandai Namco distributed a press release that read, Built upon the foundation established by Souls series creator and Dark Souls 2 supervisor Hidetaka Miyazaki, with development helmed by From Software director Tomohiro Shibuya, Dark Souls 2 will feature a new hero, a new storyline, and an unfamiliar world for players to survive in, while delivering its signature brand of unrelenting punishment that players hunger for. For the first time, the new game director, Tomohiro Shibuya, also addressed the gaming community, stating, This new chapter in the Dark Souls saga presents opportunities for us to drive innovation in gameplay design, develop an entirely new story, and expand the scope of the world in which the player interacts with the game. We have taken these necessary steps with Dark Souls 2 in order to evolve the overall experience of the Dark Souls series. That night, the Souls games community was ecstatic with the trailer and celebrated the unexpected reveal, not yet focusing on the fact that Miyazaki was assigned merely as a supervisor on the game, with Tomohiro Shibuya as the director. At that time, it wasn't even clear what the role of a game supervisor meant in the context of Dark Souls 2. However, on the following day, December 8th, Edge magazine teased their upcoming feature about Dark Souls 2. And this is when the community started to react negatively to the news. Edge Magazine said, Dark Souls 2 was officially announced last night at the Spike Video Game Awards. We've already seen it, and it's the cover star of our next issue, out December 20th. An eternal battle rages at the heart of Dark Souls 2. On one side stands the stern force of challenge, the very soul of the Souls series. It has inspired thousands of fans to hack their way through two of the most demanding and rewarding games of an era, fans who expect at least the same test on the next go-around. On the other side is the bright promise of accessibility. And why not? Why shouldn't From Software and Namco Bandai open souls up to a wider audience when it could otherwise be in danger of becoming stuck in a cult cul-de-sac? As we find out in issue 249, the answers to these questions are in the hands of game directors new to the Souls series, Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanimura who have taken the reins from Hidetaka Miyazaki. Their descriptions of how they intend to mold Dark Souls 2 into a more approachable form seem reasonable, but Shibuya admits that their approach will be influenced by their individual characters. I personally am the sort of person who likes to be more direct than subtle, he tells us. It will be more straightforward and more understandable. We sympathize if that sort of statement concerns you, 
But at the same time, we can surely agree that we would all like to see Dark Souls attain as great a presence as the Elder Scrolls. How it gets there is a worthy matter for debate, but it's certainly a noble task. As expected, the article in Edge magazine sent the Souls community into a frenzy when the new director shared his intention to make the series more approachable. The community's reactions can be divided into two groups. One believed that the new directors would simplify the core gameplay's difficulty, while the other thought they would adopt a more direct style of storytelling. Regardless of their stance, both groups shared the belief that the new game might target the Elder Scrolls audience. However, at this point, no one in the community had noticed that the official press release from the previous day mentioned only one game director, Tomohiro Shibuya. The next day, Edge Magazine reported that there were two game directors, including the still unknown Yui Tanimura. To gain a clearer understanding of how the Souls community felt during the week of the Dark Souls 2 reveal, let's delve into Keiza McDonald's blog post in reaction to the Dark Souls 2 announcement and the Edge Magazine article. You might recall her from our previous video on the making of Dark Souls, where we mentioned that she was one of the earliest journalists to cover the Souls games, even before they gained popularity in the West. This blog post was dated December 11th, just four days after the unveiling of Dark Souls 2 and three days after the Edge magazine article. In her post, she said, When I woke up on Saturday morning to the news that Dark Souls 2 was on the way, I literally leaped out of bed with joy. But ever since I actually watched the trailer and read Edge magazine's teaser for their forthcoming Dark Souls 2 issue, there has been a fine mist of unease settling in my brain. Of course, it's ridiculously early to be passing judgment on the game. I've not seen it, obviously, and it's faintly ridiculous to be worrying already. But I can't help it. I care too much. I am emotionally invested in this series, having seen it develop from Asia-only PS3 oddity to worldwide sensation, shanking the self-importance of gamers everywhere, and reminding us of the value of games that put their own vision before a player's continual pampered comfort for a change. Demon's Souls and Dark Souls represent gaming with hard edges, gaming that respects itself as much as the player. They expect 100% of your attention, and they absolutely reward it. They represent something I deeply love about video games. They are awe-inspiring artifacts of game design, and will be no matter what happens with the sequel, they always will be. But there are four things about Dark Souls 2 that I find a smidge disturbing. From Software's Hidetaka Miyazaki was the director of both Demon's Souls and Dark Souls, and his influence is everywhere in those games. He's an exceptionally sharp and unusual character, utterly uncompromising in his vision and fastidious about realizing it. He takes an extremely active role in everything from art design to player feedback, from the intricacies of the game's mechanics to the overarching themes of death and hopelessness that permeate every tiny element of it. And he's not directing Dark Souls 2. Instead, we've got Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanimura, both of whom are a mystery. This really concerns me. When we interviewed Miyazaki in 2011, he gave the impression that he wouldn't do another Souls game unless he knew it was breaking new ground once again. Miyazaki is apparently staying on as an advisor, but if he's no longer in charge of Dark Souls, does that mean he can't think of where to take it next? Frankly, if Miyazaki can't take Dark Souls in brave new directions, I'm a bit skeptical that anyone can. This is the big one. Edge Magazine were the first people to see Dark Souls 2, and their issue about it doesn't come out until December 20th, but they've released a few preview paragraphs that are making my stomach tighten a bit. Straightforward and understandable are two adjectives that do not exactly roll off the tongue when talking about demons or Dark Souls. I am absolutely not a fan of treating gaming as a horrible, self-congratulatory hardcore niche rather than a huge and wildly varied entertainment medium, and I'm not about to go all hipsterish about souls and claim that it can only possibly be any good if it's not popular, but it would break my heart totally to see it sacrifice what it is in order to become something that Namco or From or whoever imagines will appeal to more people. Absolutely no to this. I really, really hope this doesn't happen. This is probably amazingly paranoid and nitpicky, but that trailer music just isn't giving me the soul's feeling. Hear that? Starting innocuously about halfway through? That's electric guitar. No 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 no. Power chords over a title screen is not souls at all. Try bleak nothingness punctuated very occasionally by eerie, discomforting choral noise or screams of pain. Those power chords, they chill my soul. 
Still, it's only the trailer. Let's completely ignore the tedious and unanswerable question of whether Dark Souls was better or worse than Skyrim, and instead acknowledge that they are extremely different games that appeal for extremely different reasons. Skyrim is a giant playground set out for you to investigate and enjoy, but a lot of it is only surface deep. Dark Souls is an impenetrably intricate set of systems that yield progressively more enjoyment and delight the deeper you dig into them, but only if you're prepared to give yourself over to the game. They're very different, and both very good. But I do not want Dark Souls to become Skyrim. We already have Skyrim. Looking at the trailer, so many things about it suggest a slightly more conventional Elder Scrolls-type aesthetic and setting in place of the dark, blackly gothic, creatively disturbing people and places of the Souls games. There's a dragon in a blizzard. There are snow-topped peaks. Look at the guy's helmet. He's wearing fur. The most probable thing here is that they've made the trailer look as accessible as possible to excite the VGA audience, rather than that it's representative of the game. But still, I'd like to see more disturbed things, please. You know what was in the Prepare to Die Edition trailer? A giant demonic hand made of rotting eyeballs and bones, pulling the player into inky blackness. Undoubtedly, even in the first week following the reveal, it was clear that the game was already showing signs of being divisive. This is the story of the making of Dark Souls 2, and how it became the most polarizing entry in the Souls series. Join me as we delve into its development and uncover the fascinating journey behind From Software's third Souls game. In addition, we will explore five mysteries about Dark Souls 2 that I discovered during my research for its creation. We will do our best to unravel these mysteries with concrete evidence, supported by facts, documents, and dates. Here are the mysteries we will investigate. Throughout 2012 in Japanese interviews, only Tomohiro Shibuya is presented as the game director, with no mention of a co-director. However, in Western interviews, co-directors are mentioned. Strangely, only Shibuya appears in the actual 2012 interviews. From the game's announcement until its release, there is no interview where both co-directors are present, whether in video or in writing. Why did Tomohiro Shibuya disappear from all interviews starting in February 2013 and onwards? Only Yui Tanimura appeared in all subsequent interviews. Yui seemed to participate in interviews every few weeks from April 2013 to March 2014, both in video and in writing. How did he manage this, especially when Hidetaka Miyazaki himself had expressed the challenges of attending events and interviews while actively fulfilling the directorial duties? Nevertheless, Yui consistently appeared at every major gaming event worldwide, despite his exclusive role as the game director, as opposed to being a producer. How did Naotoshi Zin, the founder and president of From Software, end up as a lead game designer in Dark Souls 2 when he had never held that position before? Previously, he served as a supervisor in almost all From Software games, from the first Kingsfield to Armored Core Verdict Day. Why did he suddenly become a lead game designer for this game? In summary, we will attempt to solve the central mystery. How Dark Souls 2 transitioned from being a highly anticipated and beloved upcoming game to the most disliked and hated entry in the Souls series, leading to the Souls community launching a You Lied campaign and fans targeting Bandai Namco on social media. As a final mystery, we will seek to answer the question, why was Dark Souls 2 even created in the first place? To provide a clearer context for the development of Dark Souls 2, it's important to understand the backgrounds of the two new game directors. Tomohiro Shibuya was the first game director introduced to the community, with the original press release presenting him as the sole game director. Here are the projects he has worked on at From Software over the past nine years, including his latest project in 2012. It's evident that he has held the position of game director since 2003. In terms of experience, he certainly surpasses Hidetaka Miyazaki, who only joined from software as a junior planner in 2004. Shibuya has been working in the game industry even before 2003. There's a common misconception among the community that Shibuya had experience with the Monster Hunter games. However, this is inaccurate. He shares the same name with an employee working for a company called Dag Inc., which is one of the firms handling outsourced work for Capcom's Monster Hunter games. In an interview, he was asked about his previous role before becoming the game director for Dark Souls 2. Shibuya revealed, Most recently, I was responsible for developing our new graphics engine, 
and conducting tests for new middleware at the company. Before that, I served as a director on projects such as the Another Century's episode series. Separate from Dark Souls 2, we've been engaged in research and development for the engine, aiming to enhance our graphics capabilities and adopting a more comprehensive approach to the global market. That's why we decided to introduce the new engine in the sequel. The interviewer then inquired whether his work on the new game engine was one of the reasons he was selected as the director, to which Shibuya responded, In Dark Souls 2, there's a need to tackle new technical challenges, and in that sense, my involvement in working on the new graphics engine may have influenced the decision. We saw it as an opportunity to refresh the visual impact in this game. Therefore, for this title, we opted for a new graphics engine. Through shaders and lighting technology, we aim to create a more natural atmosphere and enhance the expressiveness of characters and monsters. In contrast to Tomohiro Shibuya, we have more information regarding Yui Tanimura's background, as he has participated in numerous interviews, providing us with a deeper insight into his career. Here is an overview of the projects he has worked on at From Software over the past 13 years, including his most recent in 2012. Notably, when Miyazaki joined From Software in 2004, he held the same title of game planner as Tanimura. Interestingly, in Tanimura's first role as a game director, Shibuya served as the producer. Similar to Shibuya, Tanimura also boasts more experience than Miyazaki, having been with the company for at least five years before Miyazaki's arrival. Yui Tanimura holds a degree in psychology, but his childhood dream was to become a professional baseball player. Growing up in Saitama, just north of Tokyo, he did not share the aspirations of many of his peers who aimed to pursue careers in manga or game development. When asked about his background and how he joined From Software, Tanimura shared, The King's Field series served as my entry point into the game industry. I've always had a passion for playing video games and was deeply impressed by groundbreaking titles like Quake and Diablo. However, one title that truly left an indelible mark on me was King's Field. Initially, I believed it to be a Western game, given its universe and cutting-edge technology. It was only later that I realized it was a Japanese creation, developed by a local company named From Software. This revelation occurred when I stumbled upon a job offer at my university's job center. To be honest, I didn't possess a strong desire to become a game creator at the time, as I was considering a long-term career path. Nevertheless, I decided to pursue the interview opportunity because King's Field held a special place as my favorite game. Despite lacking prior experience in game development, Tanimura received a job offer shortly after his first interview. He said, From Software is a unique company. It frequently hires individuals with no prior experience in the game industry. What matters is not what's on your resume, but how you think. I entered the industry completely fresh. Perhaps it was the way I articulated my thoughts or my approach to problem solving. Whatever it was, they recognized something in me that aligned with their vision. Regarding his role before accepting the position of game director for Dark Souls 2, Tanimura shared, Most recently, I worked on mobile suit Gundam UC, published by Bandai Namco Games. Prior to that, I was involved in titles such as the Another Century's episode series, Shadow Tower Abyss, and of course, the Armored Core series, beginning with Armored Core 2 on the PlayStation 2. When the interviewer noted that he predominantly worked on Mecha games, Tanimura explained, That may be true. However, on a personal level, I've always had an affinity for 3D dungeon RPGs and action RPGs like Wizardry or Dungeon Master. In fact, the reason I initially joined From Software was my passion for King's Field. So when the company offered me the opportunity to work on Dark Souls 2, my response was an immediate, I would love to. Finally, the much-anticipated issue of Edge magazine was released on December 20th. Both video game journalists and Souls fans had been eagerly awaiting this issue, as it contained the only remaining relevant interview about Dark Souls 2 for the rest of 2012. First and foremost, the feature article praised the game's graphical improvements, stating, Dark Souls 2 looks effortlessly prepared for the next generation of consoles, Every aspect of what we're seeing reinforces the impression that you'll struggle to find a static frame in it. The article featured interviews with Miyazaki and Shibuya, but notably, Tanimura, though presented as a co-director, was absent from the event. There were two main topics that readers were eager to learn about in this article. Firstly, whether the new game would be made more accessible to cater to players who hadn't experienced the Souls games before, 
and secondly, if there would be changes to the exposition style of the story and the lore of its world. Regarding the approach to difficulty, Shibuya said, Ideally, we want Dark Souls players to smoothly get into Dark Souls 2, but at the same time, I am implementing a lot of different aspects as well. So there might be a sense of awkwardness at the beginning when experienced Dark Souls players pick up Dark Souls 2, but ideally we want that smooth process. So Dark Souls 2 will have the same general feel in terms of the experience in the game. Accessibility to players who haven't picked up Dark Souls is definitely a key topic. Right in the beginning when players first pick up the game is something that I will definitely focus on. To not immediately throw them into Dark Souls but provide a good introduction in terms of what the game's about and how the game should be played. Hopefully that adjustment at the very beginning of the game will help draw in players and get them addicted right away, without immediately making players feel rejected by the game system itself. And in terms of the obscure nature of the game with regards to the story or its mechanics, Shibuya added, I personally feel that the Covenant system was something that was difficult to fully absorb and experience in Dark Souls, and I intend to make it more accessible to players. And that's not just with the Covenant system, but with a lot of other aspects that I felt were difficult to fully adapt to. I will follow the same concept as Dark Souls, but there were a lot of hidden story elements that some players may not have caught before, and I'm hoping to make some of that a little bit more clear or directly expressed to the player as well. Not just in the story, but messaging. A lot of elements were very subtle in Dark Souls, and that was something that was characteristic to it. But I personally am the sort of person who likes to be more direct instead of subtle. So I think that part of me will result in a difference for players when they pick up Dark Souls 2. It will be more straightforward and more understandable. As expected, the community did not respond favorably to Shibuya's messages in the interview. If Edge's teaser article on December 8th received a negative reaction, the actual feature article on December 20th garnered an even stronger and more unified backlash from the Souls community. This eventually led Yui Tanimura and Bandai Namco to issue apologies to the players in an attempt to appease them. Here are some of the comments posted by Souls fans on various community forums. Please, for the love of all things gaming, don't make everything too obvious. Obscurity adds depth. It's like being a gaming archaeologist where you dig deep and uncover both red herrings and clues. Except, in this case, the red herrings might be the clues, and the clues might be the red herrings. Dark Souls is arguably one of the greatest games ever made, so let's not risk diluting its legacy by diverging too far. I was really looking forward to Dark Souls 2, but now I'm worried they're going to water it down for a wider audience. It's disheartening. I hope they listen to the community and reconsider their approach. We love Dark Souls for what it is, not for what they're trying to turn it into. The thing with Dark Souls is that it's a universal challenge. You tell a friend you did a certain thing, and if they've done that part, they most likely know just how difficult it is. With a difficulty option, this becomes harder to convey. If your friend is playing on easy, and you are playing on hard, then they don't understand the challenge at all. Now that we've examined the backgrounds of the new game directors, let's delve into the development of Dark Souls 2. Based on my research experience, tracing the journey of Dark Souls 2 is similar to reading a story with the Rashomon effect. Initially, you can't see the whole truth, and you must rely on various character perspectives to construct the complete picture. As previously mentioned, Tomohiro Shibuya disappeared from all interviews starting in February 2013 and beyond. Therefore, we will divide the development sections into three parts to clarify which perspective we are presenting, those of Miyazaki, Shibuya, and finally, Tanimura. As you may recall from our discussion about the making of Dark Souls, towards the end of the video, Miyazaki had an interview where he made the following statement. I don't know about a sequel, but it seems like we can make a new one. We still need to look at reviews and player feedback before making any decisions. Even in that interview from November 2011, he was already hinting that he wouldn't be directing the sequel. He said, Dark Souls is not solely mine, and I believe it might benefit from some fresh perspectives. This interview took place in November 2011. Later on, we discovered that development for Dark Souls 2 had already begun two months before this interview, in September 2011. This timeline sheds light on Miyazaki's uncertainty regarding his role in the sequel, and his unmistakable hint at the need for a new game director. And do you know what else happened during September 2011? That was the release month of Dark Souls. 
In other words, Miyazaki's removal from the Dark Souls sequel had already been planned as early as the game's release, regardless of its sales and market performance. We learned all of this information thanks to the article in Edge magazine released on December 20th, 2012. The article stated, Despite Miyazaki telling us in an interview conducted back in November 2011 that he wasn't yet sure if he'd have the chance to make a follow-up to Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2 had in fact already been in development for two months at that stage. Shibuya mentions being approached about the project in September of last year, at which point, we're told, development was proceeding in parallel, with some of the Dark Souls team working on patches and DLC content, and staff gradually migrating over to the new game as required. We'll pause for now on further analyzing the significance of this information, but it will be crucial in solving the mysteries we've presented earlier. In 2012 Japanese interviews, Miyazaki was clear on Dark Souls having a solo game director. When asked about his replacement, he replied, Yes, that's correct. Tomohiro Shibuya will be the director for Dark Souls 2. He has primarily worked on the Another Centuries episode series and, most recently, was involved in the production of R. When the interviewer commented that many players are concerned that the Dark Souls series continues without him, Miyazaki said, I don't think players need to feel anxious for that reason. Director Shibuya is a developer with far more experience and achievements than I have, and he understands the goals and subtle nuances of Dark Souls. So I believe players can trust him. Fortunately, the Japanese interviewer seized the opportunity to ask the most crucial question, why did you decide to step away from the development of Dark Souls 2? Miyazaki explained, That decision ultimately came from the company. As for Dark Souls, it holds a lot of personal significance for me for various reasons, and I've gained a great deal from it emotionally and otherwise. So, to say that I won't feel a sense of loss would be a lie. However, the change in directors isn't necessarily a negative development. Without sounding too self-assured, I believe that the foundational elements of Dark Souls have great potential. This change provides me with the opportunity to unleash that potential from my own narrow framework and limitations. Even as someone who has been instrumental in shaping the foundation of Dark Souls, I have a desire to explore that potential. Additionally, from a different perspective, I am working on something else as a director. This response conveys three distinct points. Firstly, Miyazaki acknowledges feeling a sense of loss from not working on Dark Souls 2. Secondly, there's a need to expand the franchise independently of Miyazaki. And thirdly, Miyazaki is already engaged in a new project. It's worth noting that when the decision to remove Miyazaki from Dark Souls 2 occurred, Point 3 had not yet materialized. That project would come much later. In other words, whether or not he had a new project, Dark Souls 2 would proceed without Miyazaki. We will explore this in greater detail when we unravel the Dark Souls 2 mysteries. This becomes even clearer if we consider the Edge interview, where they posed the same question about why Miyazaki wasn't involved in Dark Souls 2. Miyazaki told Edge, The decision about the new assignments was not made by me. It was made by From Software and Namco Bandai as a whole. Namco Bandai producer Takeshi Miyazoi elaborated, stating, It was a company decision. Miyazaki worked on Demon Souls and Dark Souls, but for the IP to evolve and provide a new experience within the Dark Souls world, the new wind from directors Shibuya and Tanimura is key to providing players with a brand new Dark Souls experience. This was the right time to bring in the new characteristics and tastes of the directors for this series to continue on evolving. I hope that by now, you have an inkling of what actually happened, but we will delve into this with more detail when we solve the mysteries. Although Miyazaki stepped down from the role of game director in Dark Souls 2, he assumed a new position as a supervisor. He clarified, I will not be involved in the actual development of Dark Souls 2. I want to clarify that I will be a supervisor, not the actual director or producer. There is a common misconception among many community members regarding the role of a supervisor, with some envisioning Miyazaki providing approvals for features and concepts during the game's development. These responsibilities, however, typically fall within the domain of the game director, and Miyazaki was clear in his intent not to be directly involved in the development process. Miyazaki elaborated, stating, I have no intention of interfering more than necessary. Games should ultimately be created according to the unified vision of the director, and I believe this approach leads to superior results. As I mentioned earlier, 
various areas surrounding the core may require adjustments, improvements, or reorganization. When it comes to world building, storytelling, artwork, and similar aspects, personal taste becomes a significant factor, and I'm careful not to interfere. The only two areas where Miyazaki actively provided input for Dark Souls 2 were related to the production schedule of the sequel and the server-based network play. In the end, Miyazaki expressed his hope that the community would support Shibuya as the new game director for the sequel. He remarked, Considering all of this, I believe it's crucial for players to place trust in the new director and the production team. Now that we've explored Miyazaki's perspective on the development of Dark Souls 2, let's turn our attention to Shibuya's side in the game's creation. As we discussed earlier while delving into Shibuya's background, one of the factors contributing to his selection as game director was his experience with a new game engine. Furthermore, he highlighted what else he brings to the game, explaining, One aspect is my previous work on a variety of action games before joining this project. I believe this experience can significantly contribute to enhancing the game's action elements, including combat mechanics and character animations. Elevating the quality of action in the game is a particular goal of mine. When asked about the composition of the development team for the sequel, whether it consists entirely of new members or includes individuals from the previous team, Shibuya clarified, I would describe it as a mixed team. While some members who worked on Dark Souls are part of the team, we've also brought in highly skilled individuals from other areas to contribute to the project. According to Shibuya, the team working on Dark Souls 2 has seen a substantial expansion. While he didn't provide specific numbers, he noted that the studio has nearly doubled the internal team dedicated to world creation alone. Furthermore, they've added new members across every other department. When questioned about the size of the game, Shibuya commented, We don't intend to significantly increase the overall volume compared to the previous title. There will likely be some increase, but we aim to keep the time required to complete the game roughly the same as in the previous installment. Our primary focus will be on crafting more intricate scenes and situations, as I mentioned earlier. Regarding the connection between Dark Souls 2 and the original game, Shibuya explained, While it's not a direct sequel in terms of the storyline, the game's world remains interconnected. It unfolds within the same world as the previous game, but follows the stories of different characters in a different location within that same world. As for map design, we plan to maintain the traditional format used in the previous Dark Souls game, consisting of distinct and separate areas. Even in Japanese interviews, the topic of accessibility holds significant importance. In one instance, the interviewer posed a question to Shibuya. You mentioned earlier that there are already many fans. How do you plan to adjust the difficulty in Dark Souls 2? To be honest, I believe the needs of existing fans and new players may not align. To this, Shibuya responded, you're absolutely correct. It's a complex challenge. We are considering an approach in which the early stages of the game are crafted to be relatively accessible for new players. Then, at a certain point, we will communicate to them that this is where the real game truly begins. In practice, with Dark Souls 2, we anticipate both new players and a substantial number of existing players. Consequently, we need to cater to the needs of both groups. During an interview with Shibuya, one of the most thoughtful and insightful comments on the design of Souls games was shared by the interviewer himself. He remarked, I mean, word of mouth about Demon's Souls and Dark Souls often revolves around players sharing their own experiences. They talk about where they died, where they got caught in traps, where they felt their spirits breaking. It's not so much about the story being good or bad, it's more about the fact that these games directly inspire people to talk about their experiences. It's like a game where experiences are shared. Finally, we have reached Tanimura's perspective on the development of the game. Since Shibuya and Miyazaki no longer appeared in Dark Souls 2 interviews after February 2013, most of what we know about the sequel's development comes solely from Tanimura. Many members of the Souls community have observed the differences in enemy placements and balance between the original game and the sequel, particularly the increased prevalence of swarm attacks in Dark Souls 2. It's intriguing to understand the origins of these changes. In an interview, the host asked, As the new director for Dark Souls, what will you do to leave your mark on the game? How will Dark Souls 2 be defined as a Yui Tanimura game? 
Tanimura explained, saying, Throughout the game, you will encounter numerous small elements that I personally directed and that were implemented due to my personality or direction. However, the most significant aspect that I believe will characterize this game as one directed by me is the game balancing. I'm responsible for a substantial portion of the game's balance, including its difficulty, complexity, and the sense of frustration it may evoke. I intend to dedicate a considerable amount of time to fine-tune the placement and attributes of enemies so that players can confront the challenges and difficulties while experiencing a sense of satisfaction. Balancing is arguably the most crucial aspect of this game, and I feel a deep sense of responsibility to fine-tune every detail, ensuring that Dark Souls 2 becomes the best experience in the series that we have created so far. Even before Dark Souls became regarded as one of the greatest games ever created, Tanimura shared how he experienced immense pressure when tasked with creating a sequel to the original game, given that it was the biggest title in From Software's history at that point. He said, Undoubtedly, there was an overwhelming sense of pressure. In fact, it was so intense that it felt as if our spirits were on the brink of breaking. I'll always remember the profound sense of accomplishment we experienced when we finally achieved the master version. However, during the development process, we tried not to dwell too much on comparing it to the previous game, as such comparisons are typically made after the game's release. On the other hand, when working on a sequel, I always make a conscious effort to analyze which aspects of the previous game were well received and which were not. When asked about the elements he believed were well received in the original game, Tanimura replied, From my perspective, the core essence of Dark Souls revolves around the sense of achievement when conquering challenges and the loose connections between players. The former is essential in upholding the lineage of classic games where players can proudly proclaim, it's tough, but I managed to clear it. As a result, the game includes challenging and demanding segments, but it's vital to maintain a sense of camaraderie, even if loosely connected, through communication with other players. I firmly believe that this is one of the most significant features of Dark Souls. In the earlier section on Shibuya's perspective, we learned about his planned approach for managing the sequel's difficulty. Later on, the same question about the game's difficulty was posed to Tanimura, and he responded saying, I want to clarify that we do not have any plans to make the game easier. Just as Dark Souls focused on providing players with a sense of satisfaction, Dark Souls 2 is also committed to delivering this sense. We value the feedback of Dark Souls fans and aim to enhance this game based on their input to provide them with a highly challenging experience. To ensure clarity, the interviewer asked the question once more. I'd like to confirm again, is Dark Souls 2 ultimately more challenging than its predecessor? Tanimura elaborated, stating, We didn't set out to make it more difficult, but there are voices within the company that suggest it's more challenging than the previous game. However, since Dark Souls 2 is a sequel, we didn't want to simply replicate the same elements. As I mentioned earlier, we aimed to introduce a different kind of challenge. Therefore, for players familiar with the previous games, it might feel more challenging due to its unfamiliarity. In the interviews with Shibuya, he expressed a strong intention to introduce clarity in Dark Souls 2, both in its story and mechanics. However, Tanimura took a different approach, favoring the obscurity that was a hallmark of the original game. He explained, in this game, we've heightened the sense of freedom, and I hope players will particularly relish the joy of discovery. Dark Souls 2 incorporates various mechanics and surprises related to exploration, some of which might lead players to ponder, can you even figure this out? It's not about being deliberately mean, but rather, it's based on the concept that information exchange is also a part of the gaming process and enjoyment. This game enables players to share information through messages left on the ground, and in recent times, exchanging gaming strategies on forums and wikis has become an integral part of the player experience. In such an environment, I believe that including elements that aren't immediately evident can enhance the overall enjoyment of the game. The interviewer then inquired, So, are these discoveries in the game such that even if you consult walkthroughs, you might still miss them? This could lead to varied gameplay experiences among players. Tanimura responded, saying, as a child, I used to exchange strategies for games like Tower of Druaga at arcades, and I imagine this is similar but on a much larger scale. We've created elements that deliberately make players contemplate. Perhaps this is something no one has uncovered yet, to serve as a catalyst for player interactions. 
Of course, there are aspects that anyone can readily grasp, but for some time, there will be various hidden elements scattered in different places that no one may discover, and I find it intriguing to explore. Some of these concealed elements can even lead to obtaining top-tier upgrade items, even in the early stages of the game. In the first week of April 2013, video game journalists from around the world gathered at a hotel in New York City's Times Square to witness the gameplay reveal of Dark Souls 2. Up until that moment, the game had been only known for its cinematic trailer, which did not include any actual in-game scenes. While information about graphical enhancements and engine improvements had been shared through interviews, this event marked the first opportunity for both fans and critics to see what Dark Souls 2 actually looked like. here with IGN and I am proud to present the gameplay reveal for Dark Souls 2. I'm joined here alongside Tani Morasan, who's the game director, and Tak Miyazoe, who's a global producer at Namco. Welcome guys. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, take it away. So thanks for having us. Uh, we'll walk right into it. We'll take a little bit of time to introduce Dark Souls 2 to you. So one of the first things uh, we immediately tried to uh, improve in terms of Dark Souls 2 was the graphic quality of the game. And the most important thing is the so one thing we really focused on, um, obviously for Dark Souls 1 and, Dark, and more so in Dark Souls 2, is how much you can get deep into the game emotionally and physically. And one of the things we thought was critical to that was the graphical improvements for more reality, more realistic um, expressions of everything we want to show in the game. And obviously you just saw the bonfires, key aspect in the game which will remain in Dark Souls 2. Right now what we're trying to show you a little bit about is the combat system that will carry on from Dark Souls 1 to Dark Souls 2. One of the underlying concepts for uh, the combat system in Dark Souls is simple, simple controls and sort of the trial and error and the strategic gameplay behind it. And that will commence uh, throughout Dark Souls 2 as well. What we're trying to show you here is if you look down, you can see these lizard salamander type monsters down below. And what we really want to focus on and continue to express uh, in Dark Souls 2 is the three dimensional uh, uh, venue creation, environmental creation, so that you can really explore um, in depth. So while this was a sort of a surprise attack, we thought one of the soldiers were, soldiers were dead, but he actually came back alive and attacked you. This is something new we're trying to show you right now. This is something new we're trying to show you right now. 
So you saw it was pitch black in the hallways, but if you go back and light a torch, you can actually see the flame light up the area that you want to walk through. So what then you can do is you can be prepared for any enemies that lurk out of the dark. You actually can see them before they actually kill you. So this is an example of one of the battles that you want to have with the enemies. But what we're trying to express here is the reactions that the enemies will have. Right now you just saw that if you sneak in behind the enemies, the enemies will properly react and sort of do this backdrop on you. So they'll, they'll always be prepared to attack and kill you. And you try to escape, and now you're trapped in the dark. You try to uh, replace the torch with a shield, the torch went out and obviously it was a little bit too late. Alright, so now that we died, let's try to take a different route and show you something else. So that was an example of one of the reactions that the enemies will take and how you can interact directly with the enemies. Um, that was just one example. We'll try to show you something a little bit different now. So we feel that with, have, with the enemies having different types of reactions, different types of thought processes, um, it will allow the player to actually strate uh, strategize and figure out for himself in terms of his best way of conquering each of the venues in the game. Mm -hmm. So now we'll show you another example. So if you can see, look forward and you see a, a troll type character that has an enormous axe. And so if you're skilled enough, you can deflect away the axe. Um, but obviously the second one uh, hit, it hit you pretty hard there. Here's a different venue that we want to show you today. So this name is still undetermined or undecided yet, but we're right now we're calling it um, the Mansion of the Dragons. Um, it's a place where we set as an area where experiments had been done uh, on dragons in the past. Uh, pick up that item, it's a dragon all. suddenly moving. This venue itself has a, has a unique characteristic in that you're constantly lurking around, you're constantly being aware of enemies, but you're actually not faced up against enemy, any enemies immediately in this, in this video. Yeah. Yeah, we want the players to be nervous, stressed, really careful in terms of walking around each corner, being aware of any enemies that come in. But, so we want that emotional um, nervousness and pressure that the players will hopefully feel. So this is an item that uh, will be placed throughout the game. It's sort of, we call it the key mouth, I guess. But if you place an item within the mouth, um, it will trigger certain events that happen in the game. That's the key mouth. So the item that you placed in the mouth of the stone, um, the item itself can be used in various parts of the venue, and it will be up to the user or the player to actually be able to decide and strategize in terms of when 
you want to use a certain item for which situation. So you haven't been able to, to face any, any enemies up to this point, but if you look through the gates there, you can see something pretty big in the back there. So what we'll do is we'll take our bow and arrow and try to try to tag it and see what happens. Yeah, you shot him in the head, so he's pretty upset now. So now in this game, enemies will actually break through walls and try to get back at you. So this is another example of the reactions of the enemies that we were talking about earlier. If you didn't shoot him, maybe he wouldn't do anything, but because you did shoot him, um, he does seem a little bit upset, and he'll react accordingly. We actually want to move a little bit forward and show you a little bit more, but for today, I think we'll keep it at this, and we'll show you a little bit more of something else. So now what we'll walk into is um, some more um, information for you guys in terms of how the player will die or how what the player will experience in terms of troubles throughout the game. So this is another area in the map. We actually showed a little bit of this in, in some of the trailer footage uh, that we may be showing you, um, but it's sort of a castle of a dragon. So as you try to cross the bridge, you see the wyverns are all of a sudden getting upset and they're all acting up. <laughs> and the wyvern landed on the bridge, he flew off, and obviously the bridge broke and you died. And it's a terrible way of dying, and it seems like you have no choice, but um, we will have a, 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 a way for you guys to conquer this area. This is sort of a torture chamber that we're showing you right here, and the guy that sort of ran you over, uh, we call him the Silver Chariot right now. So this one thing we really focus on for Dark Souls 2 is the ver variety of deaths that the player will be able to um, experience throughout the game. And the reason why we want to put a lot of variations in the types of death, types of situations, is for, again, for the players to really feel that sense of satisfaction when you overcome certain obstacles. And with all these variations in the types of deaths that the player will be able to face, Hopefully, when you get over each of them, the sense of satisfaction and the uh, fist clinching um, is something that will be rewarding to the players as they get through the game. So that was a quick overview of what uh, we wanted to show you today about the improvements that we made throughout the game. Video game journalists and fans alike were highly impressed with what was presented in the Dark Souls 2 gameplay reveal. Not only did this video highlight the engine improvements, but it also dispelled doubts and concerns within the Souls community about the game potentially being made easier. As a result, Dark Souls 2 had become one of the most eagerly anticipated games within the community. Here are some comments from various forums, with almost no negative reactions to the game. I've watched this trailer so many times, I simply can't wait. It's just wow, they've really elevated the art style and graphics. This game is going to be amazing, I love the graphics and all the lighting effects, and the enemies look truly epic. This game looks grand in every aspect. The atmosphere, graphics, it exudes epicness throughout. Count me in. Five days following the gameplay reveal, Bandai Namco announced the revival of the popular Shield Design Contest, a tradition that began with the original Dark Souls game. The submission and voting period for Shield Designs commenced on April 15th and continued through May 13th. 
On May 20th, the Shield designs that garnered the most fan votes underwent a final round of evaluation by the Dark Souls 2 development team at From Software in Japan. Subsequently, the team selected the final six winning Shield designs to be featured within the game. On June 11th, E3 2013 officially began, and for the Souls community, this marked the release of a new game trailer for Dark Souls 2 titled Go Beyond Death. Personally, I believe this is one of the best and most captivating Souls game trailers ever, with the lyrics perfectly matching the theme of the Souls games, persevering and never giving up, even in the face of failure. During the E3 event, Souls fans not only received a new trailer, but also learned the release date of Dark Souls 2, which was announced as March 2014. Yui Tanimura participated in several interviews, and I've selected three of the best. The first interview highlighted the four classes that Bandai Namco had prepared to showcase improved combat, design, and graphics to the community. I'm joined by Karimura-san and Tak to talk about Dark Souls 2, specifically four player characters, is that correct? Uh, that you've created for E3? Uh, yes, definitely. So we're going to start with the warrior. Let's take a look at the warrior. What are the knight characters? Uh, this knight is the most orthodox character. The three weapons, and the three weapons, and the three weapons. The three weapons are three weapons, and あの、強力な攻撃っていう特徴があって、ま、それをこう状況によって使い分けながら進められるんで、ま、かなり安定した戦い方ができるキャラクターです。So first of all, we're talking about the warrior knight here. Um, basically this is the most orthodox sort of easiest to play with, although it's it is a difficult game, it is sure. probably the most easiest to control. Um, some of the characteristics here is he has two types of swords here. He has a short sword and a long sword. This will allow you to differentiate between your Symbol attacks and your heavy attacks, like you see here. Um, basically, it's an orthodox style. We have a shield in one hand, a sword in the other, and you can really feel out how you naturally can get into uh, the character itself. Now, I'm going to take it, but I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. これが通常の剣の戦闘なんですけど、ま、今のがバックスタブですね。ま、これは前作から気づいてる要素です。So, and next, I think we're going to see the sorcerer. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm also going to see the Gherkin from this here. All right, so tell us about the sorcerer here. はい、まあ、こいつこのタイプはですね、あの典型的な魔法使いというタイプで、まあ遠距離攻撃をあの得意にしています。まあ、ただ遠距離といってもですね、単純にこう直線的な攻撃だけじゃなくて、まあ範
kind of basically sort of specializes more in long range attacks. Uh, but not just long range attacks, we've done with a lot of variations in types of magic that are available. Uh, so they can really strategize in terms of what types of magic they want to use for certain, certain enemies. Obviously you have flames that you can shoot from long range as well as lightning sword type magic as well. Um, hopefully the new players will be able to see more and more different variations in the type of uh, magic they can use. I see. And then it's, there's the Temple Knight. テンプルナイトはですねあの奇跡が使えることが特徴で、まあ、奇跡っていうのは、まあ、前作と同じく、まあ、回復であるとか、まあ、ちょっとした補助的なあの魔法を使うことができますなので、まあこうあのー、攻撃普通のファイター的なタイプとその魔術式的なタイプを兼ね備えたようなタイプのキャラクターですね So Temple Knight, this is a character that focuses on using miracles. Well, miracles are, are types of spells or um, abilities that will help to see, cure the character, or will help out during battles and help out the character get through the game itself. Um, so this guy uses magic and spells as well, but not like the sorcerer. He uses more assistive types of spells. Um, so it's a mixture of sort of the warrior and the sorcerer.まあこれはもう見たまんまあの二刀流で戦う剣士なんですけどもまあその今回ですね単純に左手に剣が持てるだけじゃなくてですねあの特典あの切り替え武器の持ち手を切り替えることで、まあ今ご覧いただいたみたいなあの二刀流専用のモーションを出すことができます。So the dual swordsman, what we've implemented here is for Dark Souls one, you can actually hold weapons in each hand. For this one, we've really enhanced the dual wielding,、uh, which allows you to do dual wielding specific motions,、um, not just use the right hand weapon or left hand. So we're hoping for more fluid motions. You'll be able to sort of deep dive deep into、uh, the actions of the characters when you're serving sort of tagging time together. Do you have a personal favorite out of these four? この四体の中で、えっと谷川さん自身のその一番好きなもしくは得意なキャラクターとかありますか？えっとまあ自分が好きなのはあの魔法使いですね。あのダークソウルもまあ魔法で魔法だけでクリアしたので。魔法使いがまあ一番気に入っており。Yeah, I personally like the,、uh, the sorcerer. I,、oh, sorcerer. Yeah, I usually like to use my magic effectively、uh, when playing throughout the whole game. So very cool. It's one of my favorite characters. Well, I know Dark Souls fans are very excited about Dark Souls 2. When will they all get to play it? ありがとうございます。えっとダークソウルズのファンたちはダークソウルズをすごく楽しみしていると思うんですけど、えっといつユーザーたちはこのゲームを実際にプレイできるようになるでしょうか。発売は2014年の3月を予定しています。Right now we're hoping to release in March of 2014. Excellent. Thanks a lot, guys. The second interview delved deeper into questions that went beyond the prepared video by Bandai Namco, focusing more on insights regarding Dark Souls 2 and the Souls games in general. We are joined by the game director of probably one of the most remarkable cult successes I have ever seen in video games. It is Tani Murasan. He's the game director of Dark Souls from. From software, thank you so much for your time. ありがとうございます。So, Dark Souls comes out, and it's a hit. It, everything about it sounds like it shouldn't be. It's incredibly difficult. It's a, you know, it's from from software, but it really finds that audience. What do you think happened that you know that that, that made it such a remarkable success for you guys? えっと、まあこのゲームはあの重要な。So we think that there's two main concepts that underline Dark Souls. And even Dark Souls 2. One is the sense of satisfaction when you overcome the difficulties and challenges in the game, and the second is the, the loose interaction with other players, the sharing of that satisfaction or sharing of the difficulties and the challenges and the suffering.、Um, those two concepts we feel are what brings the players in and gets them attached to the game itself. So we feel being able to fulfill all of both of those in the best way that we can will keep the players attached as much as possible. All right, so let's go ahead and、uh, roll the footage here.、Um, but before we set up what what we're looking at, wh what are we, what are you holding over from Dark Souls, and what are you sort of like, what's 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 going to be new in in, in Dark Souls two? So one of the things that we've carried over from Dark Souls one、um, into Dark Souls two is first of all, going along the concepts, the loose connection with other players, 
that is something very important to the series. And we've obviously brought back things like the blood messaging, the blood stains, and the replays. Everything that players are used to seeing in Dark Souls 1, I've been brought over to Dark Souls 2. Also, the sense of satisfaction after overcoming the challenges. We've revisited the battle system a little bit, but in terms of the mechanics of how the battles work, uh, we've carried that over too, so that players can get right into the gameplay. So uh, there were some concerns a few months ago that somehow the game would become too accommodating of the player and you would lose its famous, famous challenge. It sounds like you have every intent to make that player suffer as much as possible as he's playing it. Yes, absolutely. Um, as players always want, you can take a look at the E3 demo that we've shown you here today. Obviously, it's going to be just as or even more challenging. Um, and it, hopefully, it will meet up to the expectations of the players there. And again, that's to make sure that everybody gets the fist clinching reaction when they're able to overcome the challenges. Uh, so, watching this video, the, 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 the person who is playing it is actually quite good. Um, for, for, for those that have dabbled in uh, Dark Souls and have yeah, do, do you have any advice of how to sort of think and approach the game so that they can overcome at least a little bit of the challenges that are there? So a couple of words of advice I could probably give is, first of all, to pay attention, be aware of your surroundings. Um, you're, always, you're never always just up, up against an enemy. As long as you're aware of what's around you, uh, take, take in the hints that you see in the environment, just be aware and be cautious. Don't be too aggressive. And um, it'll help uh, new players get over the challenges. And second advice is try not to give up. You know, you're going to face a lot of deaths, but don't let that hurt you. You know, keep trying, keep trying new things, and keep challenging. Caution, caution, caution. Um, my, my, my one final question is, I'm curious how you're reacting to sort of the, the online aspects we're seeing with next-gen systems. One of the things that really stands out about Dark Souls, and before that, Demon Souls, was what you were doing with the multiplayer. It was very innovative, and I, I, I was wondering if you sort of see the, the new consoles that are out there are trying to make it easier for other developers to start to experiment with what you guys really were at the forefront of. So, um, with all the next-gen um, announcements and details about online, and we feel that that's very attractive, and I'm sure that next-gen consoles will allow more room for experiments and stuff like that. But the way we develop is we don't really take what's available and try to adapt that to the game. What we do is we design the game in a way that we want to design it, and we see if we can implement those ideas into the consoles that we're working with. Um, as much as next-gen consoles will provide a lot of new specs, a lot of new um, abilities, um, although Dark Souls 2 will be on current-gen consoles, um, you know, there, if, if new ideas for online space comes up, we will do our best to implement it, but not necessarily due to the, the specs that are available. The third interview featured questions that showcased the host's familiarity with the story and mechanics of the Souls games. Presenting Game Control, I'm here with Talk, the global producer for Dolher Souls 2 from Bandai Namco, as well as Tani Murasan, who is a director from From Software, the actual creators of the game. And we're here to talk Dark Souls 2, sequel to one of my favorite games. I cannot wait. So, uh, one of my first questions I have for you is that from watching the trailer, it looks like the Castle Dragons just might happen to be the painted world of Ariyamas. Can you talk any bit about that? あの、あの、あの、we don't want to give away too much, yeah. so we can't really talk about it very much. But that one area is actually a place where um, a sort of a unique dragon lays, I guess, and the player's task will be try to get through all the wyverns that fly around to sort of meet this dragon. Yeah. But okay, so Dark Souls Two is supposed to be the same universe, I believe, from Dark Souls. Is that correct? So it's in the same universe, but um, Dark Souls 2 sort of takes place sort of in a different um, location, Warcraft, right. right, in a different place. So um, in terms of story, they'll be totally independent of each other. Okay, well being that it doesn't take place in Lordran, but still 
the same Dark Souls universe, but dragons are alive. So if dragons are alive, does that mean maybe it's kind of a prequel to Dark Souls? ま、さっき数千あの、so we don't again we don't want to reveal too much you know we want we don't want to spoil anything for the players um but there is a sort of element of time as well it might different location maybe a different time as well so again the stories in terms of relationships we're not going to reveal anything we're going to tell you that they're different stories um and hopefully the players can look forward to what they experience in the game now being that hidetaki miyazaki is now no longer on dark souls 2 are you what are you doing to make sure that it'll still appeal to the players who love dark souls 1 えっと、オールドファンタジー、古き良き時代のオールドファンタジーをあの、ま、現現代的な解釈を加えつつ再現しましょうと、ま、風格を重視しましょうといった部分はあの、意識して進めています。だからそういったその、あの、浸透なる部分はあの
pretty quickly, like instantly to a certain amount. Um, well, how the gem works is gems will gradually, slowly but gradually, uh, replenish your health. Not as much as the SS Flask will, but there will be certain items that you can pick up throughout the, throughout the game, um, sort of as an assistant to, to your journey, I guess. Now, I've read that the Dark Souls team was dissatisfied with how often people would use humanity in Dark Souls and experience the online multiplayer system. Are you doing something with Dark Souls 2? So it's a little more accessible or you, or people are more likely to use the multiplayer features. で、あの、それに対して改善も考えてはいますが、そのちょっと具体的な手法についてはちょっとまだ、あの、調整していることもありますし、ちょっとまだお話しできないですが、まずちょっとそこ改善しますということで。So in terms of how players played with the online how um, and how that wasn't the original intent. Um, yeah. That is definitely something that uh, we are trying to revisit right now. It's hard to give um, any uh, direct answer to how we are. We're still trying to figure out, or we're still trying to balance the game. We're still trying to implement a couple changes so that you know it works better in terms of game design. So we will keep you posted in terms of what kind of changes we plan to implement. But right now we're still um, on the drawing board trying to balance this up. Okay, and one final question for you too. Um, I've, I've read that you're trying to make it more accessible for new players, but I'm also wondering that some players who liked the original game liked it because there's so many different builds that you can do in different types of character classes. And you, I know you showed four for E3, but is it going to be just as diverse in what characters can create for them, like having a dex build and a sorcery build and a tank build and things like that? あの、それはあの、普通に入れるつもりです。あの、今回はE3版ということもあって、あのプリセット用意しましたけど、あの、実際の製品版では、あの、ま、初期にあの、細かくカスタマイズできますし、ま、装備も細かく変えたりっていう
later on, it might be something different, right? It might be something different. We're not totally ready to talk about the details just yet, but rest assured, I think minds will be blown when we tell people what's going on with that mirror night and the, the minions that come out and whatnot. So uh, it's going to be pretty Stay exciting. tuned, in other words. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, but yeah, this is the first time people are playing the game. We've gotten great reception. People are already saying, oh my God, this is like my most anticipated game for myself for the right. year. Uh, especially, you know, I mean, people have been talking about, you know, the difficulty, is it really still there? Well, come on by and I, I tell you, experience it firsthand. You'll see that difficulty has been preserved in spades. In an interview, Yui Tanimura shared what the team had done to enhance exploration and create more diverse deaths. He also discussed his team's efforts to balance the feelings of satisfaction and challenge that Dark Souls is beloved for. So there's two main, main underlying concepts of Dark Souls. One is the satisfaction that you get from overcoming uh, the difficulties and the challenges of the game. We feel that the higher the difficulty, when you overcome, the higher the sense of satisfaction. So um, that sense of fist clinching, I guess, is one of the main concepts that we want to really pursue uh, in Dark Souls 2 as well as we did in Dark Souls 1. Second is sort of the loose connections that you have with other players on the online space um, within the world. Um, it's not a direct relationship, but you can sense uh, the feeling that other players are suffering the same challenges, and you can sense that other players are overcoming the obstacles in the game. So those two um, main concepts are things that we wanted to really uh, focus on for Dark Souls 2. On top of that, as sort of going into the next phase uh, within Dark Souls 2, to really express a sense of satisfaction and um, you know, to really bring out the challenges in the game, we wanted to add uh, more variations, more variety of the types of deaths that the players can really uh, face. Um, we wanted to add a little bit more variety so that the players can really dive deep into uh, the Dark Souls world and really um, feel the core essence of what we want to communicate using the difficulty and the satisfaction um, of overcoming. So there's a couple ways that we approach this. Obviously one is um, we make sure that the concept of the certain area or the certain situation is clear for the development team. What do we want the player to experience? What do, the, what do we want the player to actually do? Um, is this an area that we want the player to really suffer in or is this an area that we want the player to sort of smoothly try and get through um, those different different concepts we have to be sure so that we put enough we balance the game enough so that it's not always just difficult or always just easy or you know we put a lot of variations and make sure to keep true to the concept of each individual area second part is it's pretty obvious but we internally we repeatedly play the game and repeatedly make sure that certain hints, I guess, or clues for the players are clear enough for the players to anticipate or figure out for themselves how to get overcome the challenges. Um, or we make sure that there's enough in the environments or in the surroundings so that the players can realize um, what they are trying to do. Um, second is we make sure that the players are able to play through the game um, while realizing, but also give them enough time, just enough time to be able to react to certain uh, things that occur in the game. So obviously having, having the concept of clear cut, but also repeatedly playing enough so that we find the perfect balance is something that we really concentrate on internally. So there's actually a lot of things that you know we're trying to newly implement. So and we can't reveal everything so that we don't do very many giveaways. But I think one of the things that the players will notice as a difference from Dark Souls One to Dark Souls Two is sort of the freedom of exploration. Um, in Dark Souls One, everything was seamless, and you know we try to have the player a certain amount of freedom to be able to freely roam and explore. But there were certain points where you had to do one thing to, in order to get to the next area, um, which was not necessarily bad, but it's something that we wanted to improve so that players really feel they have the choice of being able to go certain places or they can travel to certain areas of the game by their own choice and not be sort of forced by the game in terms of how they proceed. Several weeks after the San Diego Comic-Con, Bandai Namco unveiled a teaser trailer featuring a blacksmith forging the armor of the character from the game trailer.
Just seven days later, at Gamescom 2013, the full video titled Forging a Hero was revealed. In Dark Souls 2, fearless adventurers will don the armor of a new hero. He is a man alone, and never more than a sword's edge away from death. To bring the enigmatic hero to life, Namco Bandai Games asked armor specialists Armedia to recreate his armor. Armedia is a working forge hidden in a valley near the Franco-Swiss border. Since 1970, they've been producing authentic armor for films, TV shows, and countless events. Stefan is the fourth generation of master blacksmith to work here. His armor is based entirely on images provided by From Software, the developers of Dark Souls 2. The plastron is the steel breastplate that protects the upper body. The Coal Forge reaches a blistering 1200 degrees Celsius. Stefan uses the hollows of this ancient tree trunk to beat the sections into shape. The curved shape of the shield was achieved using an old boat building technique. Stefan's wife Mireille applies stain to give the shield its battle-worn look. The blade is hardened by heating it to 850 degrees Celsius, then quickly submerging it in water. The belt grinder turns at 1500 RPM and can tear through skin like tissue paper. This blade's sharp edge makes it more dangerous weapon than stage prop. Murray is a skilled costume designer and takes care of the fabric and leather parts of the outfit. A stiff brush and natural pigments complete the well-traveled look. The leather inner and steel jointed outer of the gauntlets give flexibility and protect fingers. Shoulder pauldrons are made in sections to allow movement without compromising on strength. The most complex piece is the helm, which takes six weeks to complete. The plasma torch uses compressed air and an electrical arc to slice through the steel like butter.
the pneumatic hammer delivers 12 kilograms of pressure per strike, enough to flatten unwary thumbs. It's a challenge to create a perfectly symmetrical helm by eye alone. The chainmail hoops are cut on a machine Stefan built. Fire and oil do a good job of aging the chainmail. The complete costume weighs a full 20 kilos. It's taken eight weeks and tested Stefan's skill as a blacksmith. Finally, the hero of Dark Souls 2 is ready to kill, or be killed. Gamescom is one of the largest and most prominent annual fairs for video games in the world. Typically held in Cologne, Germany, it serves as a platform for video game developers and publishers to showcase their latest products. As expected, both Yui Tanimura and Takeshi Miyazo were present at Gamescom 2013. While we've already shared three interviews with Tanimura during E3, here we'll feature an interview with Miyazoi from Gamescom, where he shares insights on the development of Dark Souls 2. Well, when we first announced the game, um, there was a lot of talk about the game becoming easier, um, but I can assure everybody uh, that the game will not become easier. It will be just as or even more challenging and difficult as uh, Dark Souls was. Um, I think players can expect to have just the same as or even a better experience um, with the difficult challenges. One of the reasons for that is the main goals of the director is not to make a difficult game but for players to sense a sense of achievement and accomplishment when they're able to overcome these difficulties in the game and for the bigger fist clinching, uh, the higher the barrier, the higher the difficulties, the better feel you get. So uh, I can assure you that the difficulty will not get any easier and it'll get worse, uh, <laughs> if anything. Well, first of all, in terms of um, the changes that will be in Dark Souls 2, is first, we've implemented a new um, uh, engine, I guess, game engine, which allows for vi better um, visual graphics, better representation, um, so that the players can sort of immerse themselves deeper into their role and deeper into their character. We're hoping that uh, the better controls and the better immersiveness will help the players more adapt to the certain actions that have to be carried out through the game. In terms of teaching the player how to play, there's no intentions to really change that from Dark Souls 1. I think we want the players to really take on their roles and figure out for themselves in terms of how they want to conquer, how they want to play the game. Um, the game's very based on how you learn from your deaths, how you learn from your mistakes, how you pay attention to everything around in the environments to be able to struggle through the difficult tasks um, going forward. Um, we do plan to implement or enhance certain features so that um, it, it cuts away a lot of this fat, it cuts away a lot of the tediousness that was in Dark Souls 1. An uh, example of this is something like uh, being able to warp from bonfires to bonfires um, from the beginning of the game, assuming that each of the bonfires have been lit. Some of these things help to streamline so that you don't have to do the tedious traveling back and forth, but you can really concentrate on the pure essence and the core of what Dark Souls tries to represent. The seamless uh, exploration will be a big concept in Dark Souls 2 as it was in Dark Souls 1. Um, so in terms of the game mechanisms, I think a lot of things will function similarly. But we plan to maintain everything that was great for Dark Souls 1 and further enhance some of the other features that support that. In terms of the story, um, 
I'm not ready to give you too much information right now, but I can tell you right now that the story itself is separate from Dark Souls 1. Um, it'll happen in the same universe, but the two stories take place in different areas of the, of the world itself, so there's not a direct connection between the two. However, if you are a hardcore gamer, or if you've played Dark Souls enough, you might see some resemblance, um, some connections between the two stories. The methodology that we take, the methods of storytelling, will be very similar to what we did for Dark Souls 1. What we want the players to do is explore through the world, hear what all the NPCs have to say, um, read all the you know item descriptions, etc., to sort of piece together your own story. I think uh, for Dark Souls 2, we really want to enhance a lot of the role-playing that the character does in the world and have the player really under try to understand or develop his or her own story um, as they speak with different characters in the game. Well, um, Dark Souls 1 was more of a, a P2P sort of connection, whereas Dark Souls 2, we're hoping to implement, well, we're, we're going to implement game servers, which hopefully will help the network features and online um, experience by for instance, um, increasing the level of um, connections you have with other players. You might be able to be able to match up with other players a little bit more frequently. You'll probably be able to see a lot more blood stains. You'll probably be able to see a lot more blood messages so that you don't have this direct connection, but you have this loose connection and you will feel like you have other players in the same world sort of um, experiencing the same difficulties um, without directly being able to communicate with other people. Um, for Dark Souls 2, uh, we want to maintain the same sort of concept of this loose connection with other players in the world. So um, there won't be a method to directly um, play with friends or uh, summon friends or anything like that. Um, however, the frequency of matching, etc., will be improved by the existence of the game server. So um, hopefully <clears throat> you will be able to co-op or be invaded by other players um, as much as it won't be as direct. Yes, absolutely. The Covenant system is um, would be core, uh, a core element to Dark Souls and we hope to enhance it a little bit to have to help it um, help the players take on a bigger role in the world itself. We plan to implement um, similar covenants that were in Dark Souls 1 but also add new types of covenants that players hopefully can look forward to. We haven't been able to finalize everything, we're still balancing and tuning the game right now. But um, in terms of weapon mechanisms um, and systems, uh, I think a lot of it will carry over from Dark Souls 1. Based on discussions with the director um, and with the development team, I've heard that the size of the world would generally be around the same as what it was for Dark Souls 1. Again, the exploration and the seamlessly connected world will be an important factor for Dark Souls 2, and hopefully players will be able to explore and discover new things in the world in Dark Souls 2 again. Uh, Dark Souls 2 is only planned for release on current gen consoles, so the PS3, Xbox 360, and the PC. At the end of Gamescom, Bandai Namco released a video showcasing the participation of various guests in their exclusive Dark Souls 2 community event.
On the second day of Gamescom, Bandai Namco unveiled the winners of the Shield Design Contest. After weeks of fierce competition and over 1,800 submissions, From Software selected six exceptional shields to be included in Dark Souls 2. The names of the contributors were also added to the game credits, and they received a signed special edition copy of the game as recognition for their achievements. In addition to From Software's selections, they also revealed the six community shields that received the highest number of votes from fans. The creators of these shields were rewarded with a special edition of Dark Souls 2 in recognition of their contribution. Two weeks after Gamescom, Bandai Namco announced the Dark Souls 2 beta for PlayStation and opened registration for the event starting on October 12, 2013. During one of the interviews this week, Miyazoe shared a significant piece of information regarding the evolution of the Souls games, particularly concerning a boss mechanic that allows you to encounter them early on. He explained, There will be areas where you can encounter the boss halfway. If you're skilled enough or paying close attention, you might be able to defeat them early. We're aiming to create a more interactive gameplay experience that breaks away from the traditional pattern of start point boss and then a new start point. This mechanic can be observed in the boss encounter with the pursuer. They later revisited this approach in Dark Souls 3 with Dark Eater Medir and in Elden Ring with Ancient Dragon Lanciax. A few days after the beta announcement, Bandai Namco officially confirmed that March 11, 2014 would be the release date for Dark Souls 2. Alongside this announcement, they also unveiled a new game trailer titled Aching Bones. You can find a link to the full trailer in the description since it contains copyrighted music on YouTube. The Souls game series has a history of participation in the Tokyo Games show, starting with Demon's Souls, during which the team learned that creating a demo for such events could be challenging and risky. However, with the Souls concept firmly established by Dark Souls, and with the full marketing support of Bandai Namco, things were different for Dark Souls 2. On September 19th, Bandai Namco invited media representatives from around the world to their headquarters in Tokyo for an opportunity to play the Dark Souls 2 beta. This event resembled the community event at Gamescom, but this time, all attendees were specialized journalists. Hi, my name is Taki Miyazoe. I'm a publishing producer here at Namco Bandai Games. We're here in Tokyo, Namco Bandai Game headquarters at our pre-TGS media event, ready to present Dark Souls 2. I've never been here before when we got out of the, uh, the subway and I saw this pyramid-shaped building. I was like, are you for real? <laughs> and I like the forest downstairs. I had a play in the forest. I don't think I was allowed to, but I just went in. It's really funky. I love the little um, Bandai Namco farm downstairs and everything else, but it's Tokyo. It's such a cool place. This is not an office. This is a legit headquarters. I mean, underneath is probably some X-Men type jet. I love Dark Souls. I, um, when I first sat down to play it, I thought, okay, here's another hack and slash, let's get into it, da 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 And then it just, it hits you with this wall and it makes you reassess the way that you game. 
some games I'm playing, I just feel too simple. You get your, your hand is held. You know, you, you're being told the hints of press X to not die. You know, do grapple hold by pressing this button in the middle of battle. And it's like, it's nice to be shown a game where it's like, no, you work this out for yourself. Yeah, at the same time, uh, it's not frustrating because you, while playing, you discover the, um, the, the taste of playing for, for the flavor of playing itself. It feels like Souls, that's the most important thing. You know, the enemy patterns feel unique and interesting. This game, from what I've played so far, because I don't want to spoil it for the people at home, right? But I can definitely tell you that the difficulty is much harder. So it's good that it remained uh, on the same route, but at the same time, it's adding uh, new contents, and uh, I like the fact that they are developing the online components. The attack will be harder than Dark Souls 1, but we have a lot of HP, so we have a lot of chance to uh, surrounding with uh, the enemy, so we can have a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot more um, like player versus computer trolling going on. Like you would not expect the things that are happening in this game. I mean, one of the things such as the enemies, they would hide or they would just like pretend to be dead. You'd walk past them nonchalantly and the next thing you know, backstab and you're dead again. I think the multiplayer choices they're making with Dark Souls 2 are really smart and I think it will make the online side of it flourish. I always like this style of online because it wasn't intrusive. You could avoid it, but you can also get invaded and there's a lot of surprises going on with this game. I like the, the sense that other people are running this gauntlet with you in parallel and it feels like they're in a parallel universe. I like the idea that I can see someone's death and that gives me a heads up by you know, touching the blood stain. I keep jumping off cliffs and because people say jump, there's a little blood message that says jump, I'm like sure, and then I, and then I die. There's parallels to games like Journey. Uh, where you're always online and you meet these people you don't know where his journey brings out the best in humanity Dark Souls brings out the worst and also the best in humanity. What I saw uh, from the second one is uh, the torch which is a nice gameplay element there's so much that's very let's say surprising what's what is in the dark I like the mirror shield boss because I believe the enemy that comes out of the shield will be a, could be a human player. And that fascinates me, the blending of multiplayer and single player being so seamless and interesting. Once again, it's another shift. This isn't going to be a standard attack pattern fight. I'm going to have to work hard to survive this. I interviewed Tani Murasan in E3, and he told me something that was pretty interesting, was that I asked him, I was like, what's your mentality about making probably one of the most difficult games ever? that's been made. And I'm like, you must, and I actually called him a sadomasochist. I was like, in Japanese, I was like, you're a sazomaso. And uh, he was like, no, no, no. Like, uh, I actually believe in the player, right? I'm like, really? Like, no, right? He's like, no, 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 I'm actually holding your hand throughout the game. I really believe you. I think you'll beat these challenges. I don't want to be drinking with this guy because he's going to be like, here's 12 shots. I believe in you. say to the fans, uh, don't worry, it will be a good game. It's exactly what they want. I just wish you guys could play it, really. You guys will really love it. We're prepared to die a lot and enjoy it, because death brings the game to life. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit wanky, but yeah. <laughs>Everybody, this is Marty Sleva here with the Beacon of Brighton, Kaza McDonald. Kaza, How how's it going? going? We are here in Tokyo at the uh, Namco Bandai headquarters, which is honestly kind of the most gorgeous building I've seen in a long it's time. A waterfall. It's got a waterfall. It has a waterfall and a farm. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Dark Souls. We played uh, about a half an hour of the beta. What did you think? It was, a, it was from the midsection of the game. So it kind of dropped you right in there. It, you started a bonfire, you're in the kind of creepy... You're at the foot of a creepy castle, which is very Dark Souls, yeah. which is pretty cool. So, um, and then everything's kind of already happening. So it took me a little while. I was kind of looking through my inventory and looking through my stuff, being like, "What does all of this do?" And I still don't know what most of it does, yeah. which I think is encouraging. Um, I thought it was really cool. Uh, it was very, very Dark Souls. There was a lot of dark places with horrible things in them. There was a lot of um, unexpected happenings. 
and unexpected difficulty. Yeah. And there was a lot of clever little touches, even in the demo. Like, for instance, there's, there's when you finally enter this castle, there's these shutters over the windows, and if you attack the shutters, it lets light in, which helps you figure out what's going on in there. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, like, completely dark. Yeah, it really it highlighted the fact that this, uh, your, your, sort of, your torch is very important in the game, yeah. and there's a sort of risk-reward of, uh, do I use my second hand for a torch and actually see what's going on, or do I have a shield equipped so that I can actually defend myself from the arrows that are coming from the darkness? Um, so I really like that sort of, and if you put the torch away, then it's, it's extinguished until the next time you find a bonfire. So I really sort of like that, uh, you know, that risky element of it. You can choose to either see what's coming for yep. you or attack what's coming yep. at you. Like, that's it. <laughs> like you have neither, either, either knowledge or power. Exactly. One or the other. Yeah. It adds a really cool element though, because um, there's a lot more darkness, and it's not like um, in Dark Souls you usually had a little light, like a lantern hanging from from your hip and you yeah. can kind of see what was going on here you, you have to choose whether you want to see what's going on or not yeah. and that in itself becomes a strategic decision that was the biggest kind of gameplay change really a lot of it felt very familiar which is no bad thing if you're a Dark Souls fan uh, that was the biggest gameplay change for me was, was seeing how the how the torch worked and you also have to memorise like if you go into a room with a torch you have to memorise what it looks like because next time you come through you might not have it sure. at that time yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I, I rolled through, uh, we got a choice of six character classes, uh, I rolled through as a sorcerer, which is what I play Dark Souls 1 as, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's really cool, especially in this sort of, uh, I don't know, just in the gaming climate we're in, like the fact that, that FromSoft is willing to give, like, just go that extra step and say, like, yes, and you can role play as whatever character you want, which I think is cool. I think it reflects a greater um, element of customization about your character as well. Like, I mean, they've always been a cipher. Your Demons or Dark character was always a cipher, like a kind of blank avatar, really. You could customize their hair and stuff. But in this one, more control over what your character is and what they can do, which is interesting. I played as a, um, a dual swordsman, which was really, really interesting. Um, again, though, I mean, one of the things about Dark Souls is, it's, you know, the character that you select at the beginning is not the character you might end up playing. Yeah. It's all about you know where you put your points and when you're when you're leveling and also what equipment you're using. So hopefully that will be preserved. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we played the beta, which is going to be available to the public in October on PS3. Uh, we asked some questions. They said it take, it's going to take you about 90 minutes to get through two separate bosses. So actually, like a, a pretty you know meaty amount of content uh, during the week. And they also announced the uh, release date, which is uh, March 11th in the in in the West, and then uh, was it March 14th in in Europe, yeah, and uh, PC, yeah, PC coming soon after that. Three weeks after the Tokyo Game Show, Dark Souls 2 made an appearance at the New York Comic Con on October 10th. Here are some of the highlights and feedback from the enthusiastic fans who had the chance to try the demo. How's it going? What's your name? Uh, my name's Robert. And Robert, we're here at New York Comic Con. We just, you got done playing some Dark Souls 2. What did you think? Um, honestly, I think it's amazing. Uh, definitely a one-up for the franchise. Uh, I'm a big fan of Dark Souls 1, and this is, I, mean, I couldn't ask for anything more, honestly. Keep it up, guys. You're doing a great job, and we all love what you're doing. Oh, I think it's a great game. I, I love that it's probably one of the hardest games I've ever played, and it's going to continue to be that. And I love that mechanic, and I love that it can just kill you out of nowhere. So, Steve, you've been watching some people play Dark Souls 2, and you're a Dark Souls fan yourself? Yes, yes I am. So, what do you think of the game so far? It looks killer. It looks, it looks really good. On the same day, it was announced that Bandai Namco and From Software had partnered with some of the most exciting comic writers and artists to create an exclusive comic book for Dark Souls 2.
On October 12th, the beta for Dark Souls 2 was launched on the PS3, and the community eagerly began collecting everything they could discover about the game. Three weeks later, Dark Souls 2 became available at Play Expo 2013, and much like at other gaming events, fans were highly impressed with what they experienced in the demo. Here's one fan's feedback, praising the quality of the upcoming sequel. Dark Souls was undeniably a visually impressive game, but its technical ambition occasionally led to framerate issues, as seen in Blighttown. From what I saw, Dark Souls 2 is one of the best-looking current-gen titles I've encountered. It stands on par with many of the games that are part of the next generation. The lighting and weather effects were incredibly well executed, and the game's physics also appear to have seen substantial improvement. My only concern is how the increased graphical fidelity might impact the game's performance. The section I played ran smoothly enough, but only time will tell if we'll encounter another situation like Blight Town. Let's hope not. If you recall, the first major interview about Dark Souls 2 was conducted by Edge magazine in December 2012, featuring both Miyazaki and Shibuya. A year later, on December 17, 2013, Edge magazine published another feature about Dark Souls 2. However, this time, only Yui Tanimura was present, and he took the opportunity to extend an apology to the fans. He said, First of all, we apologize for using the word accessible and misleading the fans. By accessible, what we mainly meant was going through the process of streamlining and carving away the fat to more clearly communicate the true essence of Dark Souls. There are two main concepts we concentrate on when developing. One is the sense of satisfaction when overcoming the hurdles and challenges in the game. Second is the loose connections with other players in the same world. Our main intent for Dark Souls 2 was to enhance the experience to better express these underlining concepts more directly to the players and to cut away a lot of the tediousness that was included in Dark Souls that did not have to do with the communication of these concepts. The day following Tanimura's apology in Edge magazine, IGN released an exclusive trailer for a live-action event slated for 2014. It remains unclear what transpired with this event, assuming it isn't related to the game's release. However, there is an intriguing real-life event tied to Dark Souls 2 that unfolded in Japan, the opening of the Dark Souls Cafe. On January 7, 2014, the Dark Souls Cafe finally opened its doors to the public. From Software had announced in December 2013 that they were establishing this cafe in Tokyo, and what set it apart was its theme based on Dark Souls. The developers chose to launch the cafe as a promotional venture for their upcoming video game, adorning the eatery with a Dark Souls 2 motif. Now, patrons could not only indulge in playing video games, but also savor the cuisine inspired by the Dark Souls universe. The cafe boasted an extensive menu featuring ancient and Dark Souls-themed dishes. A week after the opening of the Dark Souls Cafe, Bandai Namco released a new trailer titled Cursed Trailer which, for the first time, reveals certain portions of Dark Souls 2's opening cutscene. Here, you can observe scenes where the graphics begin to resemble those of the release version. Perhaps you've seen it. Maybe in a dream. A murky, forgotten land. place where souls may mend your ailing mind. Long ago, in a walled-off land far to the north, a great king 
built a great kingdom. I believe they called it... Drang Lake. Your wings will burn in anguish, time after time. For that is your fate. The fate of the curse. So far, we've witnessed the enthusiastic anticipation of the Souls community as they eagerly await the release of Dark Souls 2. If you were to peruse any of the forums, you'd find nearly unanimous positivity surrounding the sequel, with all of the fears and doubts from 2012 already dispelled. However, as early as January 2014, astute fans and journalists began to notice early signs of issues that would later become significant when Dark Souls 2 was released in March. To gain a deeper understanding of just how perceptive some of these observations were, let's explore some of the articles authored by Marta Branco. In her article posted on January 20th, 2014, she said, Namco Bandai released a new set of screenshots a few days ago, and surprisingly, the images expose a deteriorating scenario. The upcoming graphics are quite similar to the previous game, but with clear signs of regression, lack of detail, poor definition, and blurred shadows, are some of the issues spotted. From Software has promised to deliver more powerful graphics for Dark Souls 2, but that's not what these screenshots reveal. Despite the gorgeous image quality presented in the trailers, the in-game visuals are awfully different and hardly impressing. Could that be a direct result of the graphical improvements intended to solve the slowdown and frame issues? Or is the game being rushed so much that even graphic quality is being affected? The most reluctant aspect in the world screenshots is the lack of quality, detail, and definition. Characters, objects, as well as environmental scenes are rendered in a rudimentary way. In some images, this issue is so shameless that characters appear to be flat and cartoonish. After posting her first article, Marta Branco published an even better one the following day. In her January 21st article, she said, I recently analyzed the most recent batch of Dark Souls 2 screenshots released by Namco Bandai, and concluded that the upcoming game will feature inferior graphics, effects, and detail quality. To substantiate this claim, and demonstrate that it's not just a matter of opinion, I decided to create a thorough comparison between the visuals of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2. Please note that all the images presented below haven't been edited or enhanced in any way. The first comparison mainly features two environmental scenarios, and the difference between the two games is evident. While Dark Souls 2 presents a flat and poor detailed scene with barely any shadowing, Dark Souls exposes neat effects, refined frame details, and proper lightning shadowing. The characters presented also display huge differentiations. In Dark Souls' screenshot, it's possible to see all the little details in the character's clothes, hair, and accessories. For the second comparison, I decided to pick two daylight combat images from both games, and the contrast is abysmal. Once again, Dark Souls 2 presents a humble scene with blurry shadows, poor detail, no effects, 
and a rusty quality. The ground looks more like 2D, the stones are completely smooth and uniform, and the grass around has nearly no detail. Now, if you take a look at Dark Souls screenshot, the characters are properly polished, every material is well refined, and nothing looks flat. Dungeons and indoors locations are probably the most appealing scenes in Dark Souls 2, since sunlight effects are inexistent, which means the rendering complexity is inferior. This comparison is not as harsh as the others, however, there are still some differences. Dark Souls 2 clearly stands behind Dark Souls in terms of definition, detail, and lighting effects. A few weeks following Marta Branco's articles, From Software hosted a significant event on February 15th to announce and celebrate the completion of Dark Souls 2. This special gathering took place in Tokyo and brought together From Software employees, along with various performers such as the comedy duo Kirin and the composer Motoi Sakuraba. The event commenced with Yui Tanimura taking the stage and delivering a speech. He acknowledged the soaring expectations surrounding the creation of the sequel, emphasizing the considerable pressure felt by the development team. Subsequently, the presentation featured product information and promotional details for Dark Souls 2. Tanimura also shared insights into their collaborative efforts to promote the sequel, including the recently opened Dark Souls Cafe and a partnership with the Chinese store Kosewa, offering a special snack known as the Black and Ephemeral Meat Bun. Following an on-stage gaming session by the comedy duo Kirin, Motoi Sakuraba graced the audience with live piano performances of two songs from Dark Souls and three from Dark Souls 2. As the event drew to a close, Yui Tanimura returned to the stage, delivering a final message. Dark Souls is often described as a challenging and somewhat inaccessible game. However, it's crucial to understand that this wasn't due to the development team's ill intentions or from software looking down on players. It was created with the intention of bringing joy to all of you. I firmly believe that Dark Souls 2 will also offer a demanding journey, but it will provide a sense of accomplishment and happiness unmatched by other games. So please, play it through to the end. Five days following the Dark Souls 2 completion event, PlayStation Access released a new gameplay video featuring Peter Serafinowicz, the actor known for his portrayal of mild-mannered Pate in the game. He was also the narrator for the earlier trailer titled Forging a Hero. Hey guys, it's Holly here for PlayStation Access, and I'm with the lovely Peter Serafinowicz, and we're playing and talking Dark Souls 2. Now, I know uh, for Dark Souls, that community is very passionate. And when you talk to communities about games, everyone seems to have a game that for them means so much to them. It's inspired them and it's given them something that other games haven't. Mm. Now, Dark Souls was like that for you, right? Uh, yeah, it is. And, you know, hearing you describe it like that, you know, makes, makes the fans and therefore me sound quite spotty, you know? <laughs> and, 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 and sort of nerdy and, and I suppose, you know, I suppose we are in a way, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but it really is for a good reason because, uh, well, you know, because f I think it's, it's the best game I've ever played. Dark Souls 1 is the best game I've ever played. And having played Dark Souls 2 now for a, for a, for a good little while, I reckon this is, it, it's as good and possibly, possibly better than the first one. It's what Dark Souls fans want, which is, it's like a true Dark Souls 2. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't like reinvent the series, which is not what people want, which is not what the fans want. They want to, they want two. They want Dark Souls 2. They want, so, so that's what it is. It's like, it's the same game. It's tweaked slightly. There are sort of, there are different things. It's a whole different world. Some of the mechanics are slightly different. You know, like we can see at the bottom there, we got these, uh, this, this uh, life gem. You start off, <coughs> you start off with probably about, you know, you start off with a few of these life gems. And they're like sort of little mini Estus flasks that you, that you squeeze and break. And you can do these on the run. You can kind of walk and do them. And I, I, I think w when I first saw them, I thought, okay, is that going to make it a bit easier? But it, it actually doesn't, and they're quite scarce in the game as well. Um, anyway, look, I'm, I'm rambling on because I, <laughs> because I, I, 
it's nice to hear people ramble because when it does come to games, when you are passionate about something, it's nice to be able to have a chance to talk about that passion and for you as well, work on it. And I love, I love listening people talk about things they love. And this is what the industry for me has always been about. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny like doing, you know, I, I, was, I was just thinking about this earlier and like doing publicity for this game is, 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 is kind of, it's, it's kind of weird because like sometimes you, you're doing a junket and you go into sort of bullshit mode, you know, <laughs> and you're just like, you know, you have like a, a series of, of like automatic responses to questions and, and uh, but with this I feel so honestly, so, so honestly passionate about it. It's hard for me to, it's hard for me to be flippant about the game. It's hard for me to be, you know, to, I don't know, to make jokes about it even. Uh, not that I, not that I like revere it or anything. It's just, it's just that I, just that I love it so much. And, and really like watching you play, all I want to do is just play the game, you know? It's, this is the first time I've played this area. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I dabbled in the original Dark Souls. I was lucky enough to sort of care for the community at the time. Right, and okay. And one of my favourite things to do was sort of just search for things on YouTube. People right. theorising about the world, because it's one thing for me Dark Souls has always done beautifully, just give you kind of just that enough to kind of really make you think and feel about the world. Yeah. But you're still kind of required to do a lot of it yourself, really. If you want it, it's there. Yes. But it, it, it's like you, you're not having a story imposed no. on you. You don't have these endless cutscenes. Uh, these games are just like skip, 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 skip. Don't care. Skip, skip. Yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're yeah. talking. Right. Fine. Let me play the game. Oh, here we go. Another cutscene, right? But it's like, but but with this, you don't really, you don't really have that. Um, uh, you have these little dialogue, you have these little dialogue bits that are sort of very, very sort of spaced out and, you know, as you say, the beauty of it is you discover the story yourself and, and in fact, you know, you create your own story for this game. There's a brilliant bit actually in this game where it, 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 it's in the first level so it's not really that much of a spoiler, it kind of is a bit of a spoiler but there's a bit near a shore in, in, in the very first level, which is called Things Betwixt. There's a yes. bit with a, with a giant, you know, just a regular sort of giant uh, cyclops hippopotamus beast. And once you dispose of him or her, you see on the shore, there's this like, um, there's this like, there's this sort of coffin on the shore. That's, it's like a stone sarcophagus, really, that, that the lids open, sort of inviting you to, to investigate. And you go over and examine it, and it says, uh, it, it says examine, and you press examine, and then you actually climb into this coffin and pull the lid over, you know, as you would if you saw yeah, a stone coffin lying on the shore. Yeah, that's the first thing I would do shore. when I saw a coffin. Um, and then, so then, as you would expect, the coffin sails off uh, across the lake, and then we, and then it fades to black, and then we could get a couple of item description yeah. <laughs> screens, like it's loading. And then the, we have a little cinematic of the the coffin sailing back to the shore. And then it opens, and then you get out. And, and I was like, "Am I in a different place?" And it's like, "No, there's there's the dude I killed before." Yeah. And, and, I, and it took me a while to work out what had happened until. Uh, I played it without a helmet on and then I realised that what it does is changes your sex. <laughs> so it's like this, this weird sex change coffin that, yeah, that, that just changes your sex, you know? And I, I hadn't realised that because I had all this armour on, the only thing that sort of gives you away, really, is a kind of slight kind of wiggle. I could see a soul, I could see a... Alright, trial and error, that didn't work. Anyway, I, that's one of the things I love about Dark Souls, is like, okay, we'll put a sex change coffin here. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Maybe you chose wrong and now <coughs> you wish you hadn't. And there's no, you know, there's no advantage to playing as a man or a woman, as far as I can tell. Well, there certainly no. wasn't in Dark Souls, but, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to experiment and, and, and change your sex, you... Uh, Why not? You Get can. in the coffin. Get in the Get coffin. Get in the coffin. It yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> I 
love it. How did you get involved then? So you have a love for oh. Dark Souls, but where did you then go, I, I, I need to do more. I, I somehow need to take my love of Dark Souls to another place and I want to somehow be involved. Well, um, I, I, I suppose I was so, I, I, I became, I would say healthily obsessed with the game in a, in a way that, like I would say an unhealthy obsession would be Candy Crush, you know? That's something, <laughs> you do it and you know it's bad. You, you know, there are lots of things in life that, <laughs> that people do and they, they just keep on doing them and, and they're like, this is wrong, you know? But, but with Dark Souls, it feels, it just feels very right, you know? And, and, and I thought, I thought, I, I, I thought I'd love to be, I'd, I'd just love to be involved with it somehow. And I got in touch with, I got in touch with Namco and I said, can you please send me a Dark Souls poster? <laughs> and, uh, and, and they did. And then, you know, I framed it and put it on my office wall. And then I, I and then I said to them, you know, actually, I, I, by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm an actor, you know, and I love video games and I love Dark Souls in particular. And, you know, perhaps I could, you know, perhaps I could voice one of the characters in the game and, and, and you know, it kind of, just over, over like, a, over the next sort of few months, that's sort of what happened with me kind of pestering them, really. Uh, you know, and of course I, I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to ruin the game for either myself or for other players. I didn't want to, I didn't want to suddenly, you know, do like, voice a character that people say, oh my God, that's the worst character in the game. It's so awful. It sounds so unrealistic. It sounds like Brian Butterfield, you know, it's like, <laughs> it, it, but, uh, you know, so I was very aware that I had to, you know, because Dark Souls got a very uh, definite uh, mood of, of sort of mysterious melancholy, you know, and I, so I, I, I was careful not to sort of, you know, to try and fit into that and not to disturb it, you know, and, but also I didn't want to ruin it for myself because <coughs> uh, I thought, I, I, I didn't want to spoil the game for myself, I didn't want to know lots of things about the game, so I, so I ended up voicing a character and whose whose intentions are ambiguous to the player and i you know when you when you have when you voice a character you know there are lots of different responses that a character can have depending on what situation you're in and i i just didn't i i, I asked them at the time i said please don't tell me uh the true um nature of this character i want it to be a surprise because he's quite sort of tricksy but he, he's either double bluffing you or triple bluffing you, or possibly quintuple bluffing you. Um, so, uh, and so I, uh, I, still, I still don't know what his true intentions are. Oh, there's a thing as well, when you, when you, when you die repeatedly, there's a thing in Dark Souls where you become hollow, which is like the sort of undead uh, version of yourself. <clears throat> and you just had a sort of generic kind of zombified yeah. face, but now each time you die, you get progressively more uh, rotten, I suppose. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, you die a couple more times, and her hair will start to fall out, and her teeth, and she just ends up looking like a skeleton with bits of bits of flesh sellotaped on. It's it's pretty disgusting, but quite realistic. And there's something, you know, it's it, it there is a bit of a sense of humour about it as well. Your posture kind of changes as well as you, as you die more repeatedly. You're kind of more, sort of hunched over and and weary looking, and 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 there are improvements, and they are like they are actual improvements. Uh, they're not, um, you know, they're not like uh, you know checkpoints or or um, you know or big tutorials or or, or anything like that. It's it's. It's it's the, it's the same thing, but but just more and 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 better. But more importantly, it's it's just more of the it's just more of the of the Dark Souls that people love. I dream about this game. I well, I I I, I think about it um, to get me to sleep. I think about being in the world, and there's something, although it's a it's a sort of hellish, uh, it's this hellish sort of nightmare 
and very desolate world, there's something I find very comforting about it. Right, well, I am going to leave it there, I'm afraid. Otherwise, yeah. we will actually be here all day. Yeah, Not I that we have a complaint, but... Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. No, thank uh, you so much, Sam. It is, as someone who loves gaming as much as I do, it is always lovely to speak to someone who shares a passion for it as well. Mm. And a passion that shines through as well. It means, it, me it means the industry can grow and develop and, yeah. you know, the people that can go out and help sort of spread that word of just what it has to offer. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> in Dark Souls. Yeah. In yeah. death. Constant in, death. In constant death, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of syndrome of people, like on forums, of people saying, I finished Dark Souls, and now I can't play any other game now because Dark Souls to, has yeah. ruined, ruined me because it's so brilliant. No other game can compare, you know? And, and, uh, uh, and it's, a, it's like, it's a common complaint. And on the Dark Souls forum, you see a post like that every month, yep. a new person and people say, yeah, I'm sorry, but there really isn't, <laughs> there really isn't anything until Dark Souls 2 comes out. Yeah, I don't know how much more I can, <laughs> Yeah. I can rhapsodise about <laughs> no, it. You know? No, that we will leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's you're been welcome. Amazing. You're welcome. I know you're a very busy man. Uh, and you guys, thank you so much for watching. And you can stay tuned to the channel because we're going to have loads more on Dark Souls 2 coming up. On February 25th, 2014, a trailer showcasing the unboxing of Dark Souls 2 Collector's Edition became available, highlighting the exclusive perks and items included in this special edition release. One day after the unboxing trailer release, Bandai Namco published a behind-the-scenes video featuring the Dark Souls 2 team, providing insights into the development of the sequel. と、ストーリーでまあ一番大きなキーワードとしてあるのは呪いです。まあ、プレイヤー側の全開と同じくダークリングっていうまあその呪いの印がまあ体に現れてしまったと。で、その呪いを解くためにまああの今回の舞台とな
that it's, it's ruined other video games for me. そうですね、まず第一にはあの続編でありますのでそのダークソウルのコンセプトっていうのを、まあ、より続編としてどれだけ強く打ち出していけるかという部分を、まあ、最初に考慮していたと思いますまあ大きくは2つぐらいあってですねあの、まあ、1つはその達成感という部分やっぱりダークソウルっていうのはその困難を超えた達成感という部分が、まあ、その最大のゲームのポイントであると。でもう一つが、えーまあ、緩いつながりという部分、えーまあ、他のユーザーとあの、まあ、その達成した喜びとか苦しみをその共有するっていう、まあ、独特の仕組みあの、まあ、それをあの達成することをまず第一に心がけて、えー、作っておりました。ダークソウルで、えー、と重要視した点というのはキャラクターとこのマップその関係つながりですねそこで、えー、と一体何をやっている、えー、ものなのか、えー、どんなことが、えー、背景に起こっているのか歴史上で、えー、何か起こった後その場所に、えー、その人がいて、えー、その人が何をしようとしているのか。でそれが、えーとおそらくそのキャラクターの表面上にも現れていて、えー、それは敵であっても NPC であっても、えー、何かしらかその世界観の一端を担っているものなんですねそういった、えー、と表面上に現れ出てくる、えー、感情的な部分それからその人の背景部分そういったものを、えー、重視してデザインしてきました。It all starts, all the brainstorming starts、uh, inside From Software, and they come up with a, a big plan. And they、uh, write a script in Japanese, and、uh, I will run through the whole script,、uh, translate it all, and we'll have、um, a series of meetings. This title is not the only thing that I've ever done, but I've ever done it. フロムソフトウェアでゲームを作るときっていうのは、まあ、大体最初にストーリーがあるパターンっていうのは非常に少ないですやっぱりそのゲームのコンセプトというのがまず最初にあった上でじゃあそれを生かすためにどういうその世界で冒険させればいいかっていうアプローチの仕方をします、まあ、変わったという話そのままできるかどうかわからないんですけれどもあの非常にあのこのゲームは。ユーザーの体験を重要視している、えー、タイトルだと、えー、思っていますで、えーと、すごくデザインで重要視していることを今回そのディレクティブにあたって気をつけたところっていうのはその感情、ユーザーの感情ですねそういったあのいろんなエモーショナルな、えー、と移ろいみたいなものが、えー、デザインに、えー、とどういうふうに反映できるか、えー、そういったところを非常に重要視してきました。やっぱりその達成感が重要なゲームだとは考えているのであのその達成感を得るためにあの、まあ、どういう体験をし,しなきゃいけないというかしてほしいかというとまあ一言で言うと、まあ、心が折れそうになるという部分ですね、まあ、先ほどお話したように、まあ、呪いを受けて実際その呪いを解くためにやってきた場所が、まあ、なんかすごいひどい場所で、まあ、散々死ぬという、まあ、ひどい目に実際に遭いますと。ただまあそれはそのまあ、ひどい目に合わせたいから合わせているっていうよりは、まあ、それを乗り越えてほしいという、まああのまあ、気持ちで、まあ、あの作ってはおります。Dark Souls is like, it's like a, it's a game, and I think games have forgotten to be games. It's like, there was a great quote from Miyazaki san who said, film should stop being more like games. And games should stop being more like films, and they should both try and be more like themselves. Yeah, but it's good to know that Dark Souls is a good game that I'm going to be able to get the game 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 to be able
and they shared the unboxing of it with the Souls community. Finally, on March 11, 2014, Dark Souls 2 was launched to both commercial and critical acclaim. There were various versions of the launch trailer, but we will be sharing the one officially posted by From Software on their YouTube channel, as its theme and music faithfully capture the spirit of a Souls game. Your flesh will decay, your mind will fade, but you won't ever die. The dark is still nascent within you. May the dark shine your way. Those drawn to the dark are destined to seek it. have seen dark that has existed from times long past. The dark that we must all face. According to the review aggregator Metacritic, Dark Souls 2 received widespread critical acclaim. Critics particularly praised the game's story, atmosphere, visuals, and environmental design, although some did raise concerns about aspects like boss quality, hitboxes, and game balance. In terms of sales, Dark Souls 2 managed to sell 261,000 copies in Japan for both PS3 and Xbox 360. Despite significant marketing campaigns led by Bandai Namco and From Software, its sales figures were slightly below those of the original 2011 release of Dark Souls, which achieved 279,000 copies sold in Japan. Regarding review scores, Dark Souls 2 holds the highest rating among all entries in the franchise. Neither Bloodborne nor Sekiro could exceed these scores, and it wasn't until the release of Elden Ring that these ratings were surpassed. The central question then becomes, why don't Souls fans express the same level of love and enthusiasm for Dark Souls 2 as they do for titles like Bloodborne, Sekiro, Demon's Souls, or the original Dark Souls? This will be the primary focus of our upcoming discussion. As previously mentioned, as early as January 2014, astute fans and journalists began to notice a significant degradation in the graphics of Dark Souls 2. This became abundantly clear upon the game's release on March 11th. The community expressed widespread discontent over what they perceived as deception by Bandai Namco and From Software regarding the game's advertised quality. One reviewer had this to say about the issue, Be forewarned when purchasing a retail copy of Dark Souls 2. This is not the beautiful game that Bandai Namco has been hyping for the past year. All that gorgeous lighting and fantastic sense of atmosphere you've seen so far? You might be able to experience those on the PC version when it launches next month. For now, console gamers are turning on their home copies and finding a shocking surprise. Something has happened to Dark Souls 2, and we are not quite sure what. At this point, based on this comment alone, the community was preparing itself for two levels of disappointment regarding Dark Souls 2's visuals. Most of them believed that the graphics they experienced in the demo would return with the PC release. 
When this didn't happen, several months later, they hoped that the graphics showcased in the gameplay reveal would finally be achieved with the Scholar of the First Sin edition, but that too fell short. Consequently, the experience left a bitter taste for Souls fans who had purchased the game multiple times on various platforms, from PS3 to PC and then to PS4, only to be disappointed each time. To fully grasp the context of how the community felt during this period, I will share some videos that gained popularity on forums, and a few that I believe capture the fans' sentiments. The first video I will show went viral because many review websites used it to compare the differences between the demo and release versions. If you want to see how most fans felt and how disappointed they were, the next video will be informative. Look at those graphics. Look at how f bad that is. That is like Doom 1 graphics. Are you f serious? How can you make such detailed backgrounds, clouds, everything, and then just have this My lord, I don't know what's going on, man. I am not impressed with that, though, at all. Every bit of Dark Souls 1 were, was brilliant. I mean, brilliant, dude. They just patched this game up. Earlier, I shared the viral video comparing the demo to the release versions. The next video attempts to recreate the exact scenes from the demo, making the differences even more evident. So thanks for having us. Uh, we'll walk right into it. We'll take a little bit of time to introduce Dark Souls 2 to you. So one of the first things uh, we immediately tried to uh, improve in terms of Dark Souls 2 was the graphic quality of the game. So one thing we really focused on, um, obviously for Dark Souls 1 and, Dark and more so in Dark Souls 2 is how much you can get deep into the game emotionally and physically. And one of the things we thought was critical to that was <coughs> the graphical improvements for more reality, more realistic um, expressions of everything we want to show in the game. And obviously you just saw the bonfires, key aspect in the game which will remain in Dark Souls 2. Right now what we're trying to show you a little bit about is the combat system that will carry on from Dark Souls 1 to Dark Souls 2. Dark Souls 2 is a simple and simple One of the underlying concepts for the, uh, the combat system in Dark Souls is simple, simple controls and sort of the trial and error and the strategic gameplay behind it. And that will commence uh, throughout Dark Souls 2 as well. What we're trying to show you here is if you look down, you can see these lizard salamander type monsters down below. Uh, 
全速を踏襲した作りになっています。What we really want to focus on and continue to express in Dark Souls 2 is the three-dimensional uh, uh, venue creation, environmental creation, so that you can really explore、um, in depth. ここは脇から突然、えー、死体だと思っていた兵士が起き上がってくるシチュエーションです。So while this was a sort of a surprise attack, we thought one of the soldiers were, soldiers were dead, but he actually came back alive and attacked you. えー、次はちょっと新しい様子を見ていただこうかと思います。This is something new we're trying to show you right now. えー、この先は闇なんですけども、えー、ここで松明を灯すことで、えー、光を持って先に進むことができます。So you saw it was pitch black in the hallways, but if you go back and light a torch, you can actually see the flame light up the area that you want to walk through. えー、そうすると暗いところでもこのように突然出てきた敵に対処することができます。What then you can do is you can be prepared for any enemies that lurk out of the dark. You actually can see them before they actually kill you. 次は戦闘の一例としてリアクションというものをお見せしたいと思います。この敵は今見ていただいたように突然背中から後ろに回り込むと背中から倒れ込んで攻撃してきます。This is an example of one of the battles that you want to have with the enemies. But what we're trying to express here is the reactions that the enemies will have. Right now, you just saw that if you sneak in behind the enemies, the enemies will properly react and sort of do this backdrop on you. So they'll, they'll always be prepared to attack and kill you. And you try to escape, and now you're trapped in the dark. Finally, to truly understand the disappointment of the fans, I'll share a video from a super fan of the Souls games. I felt betrayed when the final quality of Dark Souls 2 did not live up to the gameplay they hyped to the fans. Even though I love the game and feel From Software is a very talented group of people, it still feels unfair to demonstrate the game this way, setting expectations that just could not be met. As you may already know, the graphics in beta and pre release footage look much better than in the final product. We were told that the game had to be changed graphically as it was not playable in its original form. That's understandable, but they made no mention of this before the game's release, nor did they mention they were going to brighten up most of the dark areas. Of the game. I am a part of the minority in saying that I actually was looking forward to the dark areas of the game. It was an extra element added to the Dark Souls formula that not only fits the theme and spirit of the game, but also adds challenge and tests your adaptability to change. Players were really concerned with not being able to wield a shield when holding a torch for illumination, but that is the challenge of the game! That is Dark Souls! So I boldly say this is a good example of fans not knowing what they want, and developers catering to that for fear of losing sales. Not only were the brightness and graphics affected, but entire scenarios were removed or changed, probably due to the graphical hardware they were working with. From Software are definitely known to be a bunch of ambitious folks, but they did not tell us about this before release. Some people are optimistic that the PC version releasing later this month will have the pre built graphics, but I'm gonna shoot that theory down as it was announced that it's gonna be the same as the console. Versions. And thankfully, they told us this time. Also, substantiating my claim is the fact that they removed all the pre release screenshots from the gallery on the Steam store, as for a good while they were lying there too. I will show you in this in depth study how just about everything the director discussed and showed in the pre release gameplay on IGN was wrong, and how ultimately we were lied to, as they didn't bring attention to these changes before release. Immediately, you can see the striking differences in the in game brightness and contrast. The textures on the ground and walls were completely changed, and the buildings seem to have been extended. The skybox changed as well. Funny that the overcast nighttime version is brighter than the fair sky daytime version. As you can see, the rubble blocking the bridge is absent, as well as the ladder, and they also had rubble here. All that leads me to believe that they added the area below and the area yonder later, which also means that this was still pretty early in development, as that area leads to this one. At this point in the original interview in which the gameplay is shown, the director of From Software mentions that one of the first things they immediately tried to improve was the graphical quality. They felt that this was critical in making the player feel emotionally and physically involved. Unfortunately, in the final product, they did not meet their goal. So, one thing we really focused on is how much you can get deep into the game emotionally and physically. And one of the things we thought was critical to that was <laughs> the graphical improvements for more reality, more realistic expressions of everything we want to show in the game. 
The room originally was much darker, and you can see a halo of light around the character. This was your limited field of vision without a torch equipped. In the final version, it's pretty apparent they brightened up the area and removed that halo of light as it wasn't needed anymore. Here they show off the statue and the design of the room that was pretty much unchanged, despite it looking better with the higher contrast. The whole area surrounding the ladder was changed in the final version. There's also a guardrail here on one side for no reason. Going down the ladder, I switch back and forth so you can kind of see the differences here in this room in the lighting. Take a look at the supporting poles there on the right. The pre-release version is much more complex with more geometry. Add some character to the construction, create story, while in the final build, they are just poles, nothing special about them. Not a complaint, just an observation. Nothing shows off the differences more in the lighting and textures than this part right here. The very ground you're walking on is changed. The fire effects look just awful while in the pre-release build, they look great with ember effects flying all about. In the final product, the floor textures are repeating. This is something that I find very commonly throughout the game. There are less scary lizards beckoning and intimidating you from below, which was also what made this area look and feel so great. now freeze. As you can see, there's a lot of geometry around the door frame. The lighting and bump mapping make the textures around the door look great. The final product has a boring wood frame. Moving on, you see the torch in the room is very bright when compared to the pre-release footage. There are a few other differences which are likely due to the map not being complete. Here are some combat comparisons. Not much has changed. Nothing too different here besides the drop stone of healing was changed to life gem in the on-screen HUD, and the equipment and item images were changed in the final product. Here's where you get to see the biggest differences in the brightness between versions. Even when the demonstrator lights the torch, it seems to only help in a very small radius. In the final release build of the game, everything is visible for a great distance. Not only were the areas brightened up to the point of not needing a torch anymore, but the torch seemed to be much stronger too. You can be prepared for any enemies that lurk out of the dark. You actually can see them before they actually kill you. You can easily see the creature in the distance coming your way. You can even see an unlit torch up ahead, whereas in the pre-release build, all that is shrouded in darkness, even with the torch lit. You can also put the skills you acquired in Highlights Magazine to the test here and see that there are many differences. The thicket of branches covering the wall on the right, great textures, and the rubble on the left are among the few absent graphical details in the final version of the game. On March 14th, just two days after the release of Dark Souls 2, consumers initiated a campaign aimed at both developer from software and publisher Namco Bandai. They alleged that the graphics in the retail version of the game differed significantly from the demos and preview materials circulated shortly before the game's launch. The online campaign employed hashtags such as hash Dark Souls Downgrade and hash you lied, primarily targeting Bandai Namco's US and UK social media accounts. The campaign's objective was to seek answers from Namco and from software regarding the abrupt and unexplained downgrade of Dark Souls 2's graphics at the last moment. This occurred without adequate communication to consumers, despite showcasing a new lighting engine and promoting gameplay features that no longer existed up until just a month before the game's release. Additionally, there were concerns about whether these changes would also affect the PC version of the game. Five days after the ULID campaign, Bandai Namco and From Software issued a joint statement in response to the graphics controversy. They stated, Throughout the game development process, a game is constantly being balanced not only in game playability, but also in the realm of resource management. A developer is always challenged with creating the most rewarding gaming experience while delivering continuity in graphical quality, gameplay dynamics, and balance within the game. The final version of Dark Souls 2 displays the culmination of this delicate balance, and we're very proud of the positive media and fan reception for the game. One day later, additional information about the issue emerged when Eric Kane, a journalist covering the Souls games, spoke with a source close to the development team who was willing to shed light on what had happened. The source explained, This is what it comes down to, a playable framerate. The early builds that the screenshots came from were playable, but only just so. The game was not in a state where it could be sold at that point. I strongly suspect that they were focusing heavily on delivering a top-notch experience on PC and underestimated the challenges the new systems would pose on PS3 and Xbox 360. That's my analysis anyway. But factually, the early builds played like Blighttown the entire game. The primary reason for including various gameplay footage, demos, and gaming events in this video 
is to allow viewers to form their own opinions based on what they see. None of the gameplay I observed resembled the performance issues associated with Blight Town. The heightened expectations arose because fans not only liked what they saw, but also enjoyed what they played. Fans often share their experiences on forums, and if the playable demos had significant framerate issues, word would have spread rapidly through forums and social media. During the Tokyo Game Show, Bandai Namco even invited a group of professional journalists, not just fans, to play the beta version. These journalists would have likely noticed any framerate performance problems and raised concerns. As I mentioned earlier, the Souls community went through a series of disappointments with Dark Souls 2, shifting their hopes from one platform to another, until they resigned themselves to the realization that they would never experience the same level of quality as the demo. This doomed hope is reflected in Eric Kane's concluding remarks in his article. He said, on the other hand, this may be good news for PC gamers. If From Software was so focused on making a great, visually stunning experience on PC, then it's quite possible that the PC version will look and play the way the game looked and played in preview builds. Here's to hoping the PC release lives up to expectations. This may also point to a PS4 and Xbox One release down the road, given that the game's new engine was designed with next-gen in mind. Dark Souls 2 will disappoint fans in both cases, and it will continue to do so with the Scholar of the First Sin edition in the future. We have now reached the point where we will delve into each of the mysteries we previously introduced and offer their solutions. Three key events play a pivotal role in these solutions, and they are essential to unraveling these mysteries. Without the insights derived from these three events, we will not attain a comprehensive understanding of what transpired during the development of Dark Souls 2. The first event that provided us with crucial information is the Edge interview, released on December 20th, 2012. Thanks to this magazine issue, we discovered that the development of Dark Souls 2 commenced in September 2011, which coincided with the release month of the original Dark Souls. By having knowledge of the development start date, we can deduce other significant events that took place during the game's development. The second event is just as vital as the first as it allowed us to pinpoint the month and year when Yui Tanimura assumed the role of game director for Dark Souls 2. This event corresponds to the release of the Dark Souls 2 design works on October 16, 2014. In this book, Tanimura revealed the challenges the team encountered and shared this significant piece of information. Yes, this game actually went through quite a troubled development process. Due to several factors, we were forced to rethink the entire game midway into development. We had to go back to the drawing board and reconsider what a Dark Souls game should be. It was at that point that I assumed my current role, overseeing the entirety of the game, including the art direction. To ensure we created the game that both we and the fans wanted, it was completely necessary, but it did, of course, create a problem. We had to decide what to do with the designs and maps that had been created up to that point. Ideally, we would start again from scratch, but of course, we were under time constraints. So instead, we had to figure out how to repurpose the designs in our newly reimagined game. The crucial information here is that Tanimura assumed the role of game director midway into the game's creation. Given that the development of the game began in September 2011 and concluded in February 2014, we have approximately 30 months of development time. If we divide that in half, it gives us around 15 months of development before Tanimura took on the role. This suggests that he likely started as a game director in either December 2012 or January 2013. And do you know what happened in December 2012? It was the month of Dark Souls 2's game reveal during the Spike Video Game Awards. Moreover, from January 2013, Shibuya began to noticeably withdraw from interviews. When we use the term intent in this section, it refers to three perspectives, from software, Bandai Namco, and Hidetaka Miyazaki. The crucial event that helped us understand the intent of these three parties is the acquisition of From Software by Kadokawa on May 21, 2014. This event had a profound impact on From Software and its future games, as Miyazaki was promoted to company president as part of the acquisition. One of the side effects of these significant changes is that we gained insight into how the three parties perceive the Dark Souls series. 
We will delve further into this when we unravel the final mystery. Now that we have covered the three key events, let's address each of the mysteries and solve them with evidence. We will solve the first three mysteries together, as they are closely related. The first mystery asks, do we have one or two game directors for Dark Souls 2? This should be straightforward to answer by counting. The answer is two. However, there are reliable interviews where it was explicitly stated that there is only one game director, Tomohiro Shibuya. What's most intriguing is that Miyazaki is present in one of those interviews, confirming that Shibuya is the sequel's sole game director, without any reference to Yui Tanimura. The second mystery asks, why were the co-directors never seen together? There isn't a single interview or event where both are in the same place. And the third mystery asks, why did Shibuya disappear from any events or interviews from February 2013 onwards? There were three official making of videos created with From Software's support, and not once did Shibuya appear in any of them. If he was the game director for Dark Souls 2, how could he not be part of the making of the game he directed? Based on the three key events we shared earlier, this is what happened. The total development time for Dark Souls 2 was approximately 30 months. In the first 15 months, Tomohiro Shibuya served as the game director. In the subsequent 15 months, Yui Tanimura replaced Shibuya, and Shibuya was removed from the project. There was no co-directorship. It was a direct replacement. This explanation addresses the following mysterious scenarios. Why Tomohiro Shibuya is the only game director present in Japanese interviews for the entirety of 2012, because he was the sole game director during that time. Why Yui Tanimura is the only game director present in all events and interviews starting from February 2013, because he replaced Shibuya as the game director at that point. Why Shibuya and Tanimura never appeared together in any interviews or events, because they were never co-directors. It was a one-to-one -one replacement. Why Shibuya disappeared from the creation of Dark Souls 2 from February 2013 onwards, including the making of videos and other documentaries, and was not even present in the completion party held in February 2014, one month before the release, because he was removed from his role as a game director. One major question you might currently be pondering is, why was Shibuya removed from his role as the game director of Dark Souls 2? While we can only speculate about the exact reasons, I believe there's ample data available from which we can draw some conclusions. One key piece of information we can use to shed some light on this matter comes from Tanimura, who stated, Due to several factors, we were forced to rethink the entire game midway into development. We had to go back to the drawing board and reconsider what a Dark Souls game should be. It was at that point that I assumed my current role, overseeing the entirety of the game. This statement suggests that they had to reevaluate not just a portion or aspect of the game, but the entire game itself. This implies that the issue from software was trying to address by replacing the existing game director was of a philosophical nature. Moreover, based on what we learned about Shibuya from the Edge magazine interviews in a short time, he clearly presented himself as someone who might want to alter the traditional Dark Souls approach. Personally, I believe that it was the Edge magazine interviews with Shibuya discussing accessibility that played a significant role in influencing from software's decision to remove him from the project, especially considering the initial negative community response to Shibuya's comments, as we discussed earlier in this video. It seems highly likely that all these factors contributed to his removal. Let's address mysteries four and five together. However, it's crucial to grasp why these are considered mysteries in the first place. Mystery four poses the question, why was Yui Tanimura consistently present at gaming events even though his role was exclusively that of a game director? You might be wondering, why is this even a mystery? Well, it's a mystery because of the circumstances surrounding Tanimura. He inherited a problematic project that required extensive reworking, and he had to adhere to the original release deadline, with just around 15 months to complete and launch it. Yet, he still managed to participate in all the interviews and events, as demonstrated in this video. When Miyazaki worked on Dark Souls, he held both the positions of game director and producer. However, if you were to multiply by three the total number of events and interviews he attended while acting as a producer, they would still be significantly fewer than what Tanimura accomplished. Tanimura was essentially everywhere, almost as if he were on a world tour promoting Dark Souls 2. In fact, 
The total number of events and interviews that Tanimura participated in for Dark Souls 2 exceeds the combined total of those that Miyazaki did for all six Souls games he directed, spanning from Demon's Souls to Elden Ring. Miyazaki once shared his experience of working in both roles, saying, This is a bit off topic, but I thought I should have quit the producer title. I underestimated it. I didn't anticipate having to do so many interviews and create that many promotional videos. While I was grateful for the opportunity, the producer role demanded a substantial amount of my time, taking me away from my role as a director and becoming a bottleneck in development. It was unexpected in that regard. As a producer, I initially believed my responsibilities would primarily involve a few interviews and managing some funds. I didn't think there would be so much work involving interactions with publishers, magazines, websites. But oh man, I greatly underestimated it. Hence, it remains a mystery why and how Tanimura managed to handle such an extensive promotional role. One plausible explanation for this could be that, during the development of Dark Souls 2, they heavily relied on external assistance. Daisuke Satake, as shared in the design works, stated, Yes, while working on the previous game, I remember thinking that a larger game would be entirely unthinkable, but this project exceeded it in both size and scale. I repeatedly told myself during development that it was an impossible task. With this project, we actually leaned quite heavily on external artists, although this did require us to invest a significant amount of time in reviewing and verifying their designs. The fifth mystery could also be connected to the fourth mystery. Natoshi Zin assumed the role of lead game designer for Dark Souls 2, which is noteworthy considering that he is the founder and president of From Software. Previously, his roles were predominantly either supervisor or executive producer, which is to be expected given his position within the company. However, for Dark Souls 2, and only for this game, he took on the role of lead game designer. Before I share my conclusions regarding what I believe may explain these mysteries, let's delve into the third event that plays a crucial role in resolving them, the acquisition of From Software by Kadokawa. On April 28th, 2014, just three days after the release of Dark Souls 2's PC edition, Katakawa announced its intention to acquire a majority stake in From Software, with the developer ultimately becoming a wholly owned subsidiary of the Katakawa Group. This acquisition was finalized on May 21, 2014, and it brought about significant changes to From Software's structure. Miyazaki was promoted and took over the role of From Software's president, replacing Natoshi Zin. Among the first decisions Miyazaki made was to announce the conclusion of the Dark Souls series. Miyazaki stated, I don't believe it would be the right choice to continue endlessly producing Souls and Bloodborne games. I consider Dark Souls 3 to be the grand finale of the series. This decision isn't limited to just me. Both From Software and I share the desire to actively create new projects in the future. Dark Souls 3 will mark the final game whose development began before I became president. The next title will be a game that was conceived during my presidency. I believe that From Software needs to venture into new territory. We will be introducing new types of games, and Dark Souls 3 stands as a significant milestone in From Software's evolution. Miyazaki's preference for creating new games instead of continually producing sequels had been evident since his interview with Keza McDonald during the first Dark Souls release. This preference likely accounts for the absence of titles like Demon's Souls 2, Bloodborne 2, or Sekiro 2, especially since these were not produced by Bandai Namco. Now, before I present my conclusion, it's important to highlight a common trend in Japan, whether in anime, manga, or video games, of milking an intellectual property until its profitability is exhausted. This trend can be observed in the proliferation of games based on popular anime. Developers often continue creating games related to a successful IP, regardless of their quality or impact, until the IP is no longer financially viable. In other words, as long as a game series continues to sell well, new entries will be produced. With all this information, this is what I believe actually happened. Before the release of Dark Souls, Bandai Namco contacted From Software to make a sequel, as it is less risky for them as a publisher and is very profitable. This aligns with what I shared earlier regarding the exploitation of IPs as long as they sell, regardless of quality, or even if there is degradation per release. However, Miyazaki does not prefer creating sequels, hence it was given to another director. 
This explanation offers a cohesive narrative that fits well with the available data. Miyazaki could have worked simultaneously between the DLC Artorias of the Abyss and the sequel, which is actually the more logical thing to do, as it secures continuity for the new game in both style and story. But they didn't do this. Bloodborne is still not yet in the picture, and will come much later. This explanation also aligns with the earlier quote, why Miyazaki was not in Dark Souls 2. Miyazaki said, The decision about the new assignments was not made by me. It was made by From Software and Namco Bandai as a whole. The proper rephrase of that statement is that Bandai Namco and From Software decided to create Dark Souls 2, whether Miyazaki is on board it or not. Since he prefers not to do the sequel, it was given to a different director. Bandai Namco and From Software will repeat this again with Dark Souls 3. Miyazaki said, Dark Souls 3 started development when From Software was working on the Dark Souls 2 DLCs. Initially, I was not part of the project. I only joined in the middle of the prototype phase. That was the milestone where I started taking the lead. Honestly, when the team was working on the prototype, the overall development was not in good shape. We were already at the very late stage of Bloodborne development, and I had settled on a lot of the ideas for what I wanted to include in Dark Souls 3. There is no doubt that Bandai Namco and From Software would keep on producing Dark Souls 4, then 5, then 6, and 7, and 8, and so on, until it stopped being profitable. But this is not what Miyazaki wanted. Miyazaki said, This is because it was never our real motive for From Software to be the Dark Souls only company. For me, Dark Souls 3 is the end. The previous From Software management launched this series before I was appointed president. And so, to continue with my conclusion, after Dark Souls 2 was entrusted to two unknown directors consecutively, first to Shibuya and then to Tanimura, both of whom had no prior connections or experience with the creation of Demon Souls or Dark Souls, From Software had to overcompensate for this by making their president and founder as the lead game designer. While this title might have been largely ceremonial, it signified that the company's president and founder had a personal stake in the project. In a further display of overcompensation, they positioned the new director of the game as a prominent marketing figure, while the actual game producer, Miyazoe, played the role of an English translator. This dynamic can be observed in the various events and interviews attended by both Tanimura and Miyazo. Although Miyazoe appeared to be a translator, he held the important role of game producer, akin to Takeshi Kaji's role during the making of Demon's Souls. The promotion of Miyazaki within From Software also reflected the intentions of key individuals within the company. One of his first decisions as president was to conclude the Dark Souls series. This decision might not have been possible had he not held the position of president at the time. One significant advantage of Miyazaki assuming the presidency at From Software was his newfound authority to say no, not just in terms of the projects assigned to him as a game director, but also regarding the projects the company would pursue. He could now guide the company toward what he believed to be truly valuable, the creation of new intellectual properties, with him at the helm, supported by capable co-directors that can support him. With Miyazaki as the president, we didn't get Dark Souls 4 or 5, but instead, we got Sekiro and Elden Ring, both of which are new IPs created under his leadership. Most viewers of my channel who have followed Miyazaki's journey have come to appreciate the courage and determination he displayed in pursuing his passion, forging his own path, and making significant sacrifices. He left behind a secure job and salary to join From Software and enter the gaming industry, ultimately leading to the creation of the Souls games. However, it's equally important to recognize that Miyazaki demonstrated the same courage and determination when he chose to decline creating sequels solely for the sake of profitability. He made the bold decision to conclude the Dark Souls series, despite its surefire success, in order to stay true to his creative vision of crafting new worlds for the fans. By having the courage to resist the temptation of comfortable and profitable sequels, Miyazaki was able to bring forth games like Sekiro, which earned the title of Game of the Year, and Elden Ring, the highest grossing game ever created by both Bandai Namco and From Software. These titles brought unprecedented success and revenue to the companies, surpassing their earlier aspirations. In an alternate universe where Katakawa did not acquire From Software and Miyazaki did not become From Software's president, we might have witnessed a continuous stream of Dark Souls sequels, 
instead of the groundbreaking releases of Sekiro and Elden Ring. This highlights the importance of staying true to one's creative vision and not solely pursuing surefire profits, as demonstrated by Miyazaki's journey.